It takes a lot of confidence for me to come on the internet and say some of the things I say, knowing the amount of hate I'm going to get for it. I failed sixth grade, bro. You failed sixth grade? I did yeah. fail sixth grade. Just How do you maintain a six pack year round? I'm going to win. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do the same thing I did yesterday. The best day of a man's life is the day he realizes that nobody's come to save him. Can I just say something? I'm so sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't make you a man. Sleeping with a bunch of women doesn't make you a man. What makes you a man? What makes you a man is that you... A lot of people, they know you from, I feel like, the association with Andrew Tate. A lot of your yeah. clips, they go viral. A lot of people have kind of grouped you into that red pill community. Yeah. But I've also heard you on some other podcasts. Like I saw you on Tom Billyu's podcast yep. and then a few Pretty other guy. podcasts yeah. I've listened to. And you're very articulate and you're not the way that I feel like a lot of people picture you to be. I've said things that I wish I could say differently. You understand what I'm saying? Particularly to women on panel shows. I think I misrepresented where my heart is. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't hate women. And I don't think women are trash. And I do believe the things that I say. However, I don't think I've had an opportunity to be put on a platform where I could show who I am, particularly where my heart is. The platforms that you do yeah. go on, especially those panels, is a little more aggressive. You know, what it I mean? is. And I feel like there and are it, certain incentives. It's in those very platforms incentivized to, to do that. Be more. Yeah. Right. And listen, man, I'm not. I'm not a perfect person. You know, I think. I think that in the very beginning, I was probably in a place where I might have said some things because of that setup. Mm -hmm. Now, those shows I do believe are very important. And those men that run those shows, I love very much. And I'll always be loyal to them. And even on the last, you know, I went on a panel show recently and it was very good friends of mine that I love very much. I'm very clear about this. Yeah, who was it? It was uh, Fresh and Fit. And then the comments, they were coming after me because I was being so quiet. And I'm just at a place after this first couple of years, it's like, I just don't feel good about embarrassing a girl. You know what I mean? For me, it, it's, it's just how I feel about it. You know, I think what they do is very important though. I think that they shine a light on the apps. Like, how do I say this correctly? Cause these are, these are my friends, man. Yeah. I love these guys. Yeah, sure. They shine a light on female nature that I think the normal man would not see or understand at the extreme. And I think why they're so beneficial is because the normal man is so soft that when they see this and they're this way, I hope and believe that they kind of land in the middle okay, with a firm, you know, frame. And I do think frame is very important between a man and a woman. I um, think on social media to what you were saying about the comments is that you're rewarded for saying things that are extreme because that yes. not only gets the views. It gets all the comments. It gets all the followers. It gets it all right. the money. It really riles and so up it's the base. Like it, but it, right. it financially incentivizes you in so many ways to like, how far can we push this? Let's keep going more and more and more. Right. And why wouldn't you? As a business decision, it's just, it yeah. seems as though if, if that's what's getting results, you would tend to lean towards And that. when people yeah. are cheering you on over and over and over again, it's hard not well, I, to like well, get stuck and in and that. I, I think it's that. I think it's, um, it can be that way. But just like any man, if you evaluate your situation and you identify something you don't like, I'm sure you've both done this in your own life in some form or capacity. It's something about your life. You can just step up and fix it, you know? And I don't think that I'm on this active campaign to go tell everybody that I'm trying to fix it. What's really important to me is they see all of me because I genuinely believe if they see all of me, I'm palatable to all kinds of shows like this one, like the one I did earlier today with Ryan Pineda, man, that guy's incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, guys like Ed Marlette, I've met him recently and I think he's just freaking salt of the earth type guy. And so I just, I just believe that if I can show truly who I am, that I can in the long run, maybe not the short term, do just as good, if not better. Well, yeah. let's talk a little bit more about those characteristics and who you truly are in a little bit, because we also want to discuss, I mean, you've gone on the record to say that you have businesses that generate up to $35 million a year in revenue, correct? Collectively. Collectively, yes. Yes, yes. yes collectively. And 
your story is actually very impressive because your whole appeal or your pull in the beginning was the fact that you built up a business in like the real world. I mean, you did construction, yeah. built up a multi-million dollar business running a construction company. Can we talk maybe just briefly about how you got into that? Like what led you to construction? And then what did you do uniquely that got you successful? Yeah, I think that's very admirable, but I think that's yeah. so underrepresented right now is the trades. Yeah. And a lot of those, those, those jobs that are just not being showcased online. A thousand percent, man. These guys build the world. Like the world does not go around without the men that, that build the country and in, in, in every country. We couldn't even do this podcast right now if it weren't for tradesmen. And I'll tell you, I believe in 10 years, there's going to be YouTubers out there saying, you want to know what the new hack is? Become a plumber. I've been I, saying that. No, I I'm said it five you. years ago. Yeah. I, yeah. And I, I did a whole video breakdown. This is one did. of my yeah, earliest, the most doctor popular versus video. Plumber. Yeah. Doctor versus Love that a video. plumber. Yeah. Yep. And I did the analysis. I think I, I watched that video. Yeah. I watched that video. I did the analysis. And I believe you. For those that don't know, I broke down the average salary of a plumber starting at the age of 18 who goes to trade school versus that of a doctor who goes into law school, uh, not law school, medical school debt. I think it was up until about 40, in the 40s, the plumber was ahead financially. How, how he catches up. Exactly. Yeah. And so it wasn't until the doctors in this in like the 50s does mm -hmm. the wealth really take off because they're just making so much money. But up until that point, the plumber comes out ahead. Yeah. And could Thousand make percent. even more money if they open up their business, if they continue if they expanding. And that's not assuming any of that. Yeah, you're, yeah. your uh, salary or whatever, the um, income of the plumber, I remember, was pretty conservative as well. Yeah, I actually looked up how long it takes to be like a plumber's apprentice, how, you how much that, they you make. You did that video years ago. Yeah, it was like I, I watched ago. that video yeah. and I, <laughs> it's funny. I just finished working. I know where I watched that video. Yeah. Because it's so crazy, man. I watched that yeah. video in the Whole Foods parking lot in Town Center <laughs> no, in Baton Rouge, no Louisiana, eating chicken. I propped it up. I, I drive an F-150 in, yeah. in Louisiana. And I propped it up, and I'm sitting there eating chicken in the truck. I watched that video, yeah. and, and I agree with you then. And think that was years ago. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, and it needs to happen. Um, we live in a world where you can shake your ass on TikTok and make more money than the guy that paved the road for me to get here. And I, that's obviously not against the law. But I think it is kind of a injustice of equity in the world, for sure. And um, I've been pitching this thing called Buy a Man of Beer, Buy the Man of Beer, where anytime I see a tradesman and he's trying to buy lunch, checking out at the end of the day, trying to buy his 12 pack on the way home, I try my best to talk him in and let me do it. And, and oftentimes he lets me. I think I'm going to have to tweak the program a little bit mm. because I think that it's kind of hard for the normal person. And I get like a post or two a day. But I think I think it's kind of hard. Like I'm going to have to find another way to appreciate them because it's kind of hard to talk a man that's been working like they're they're also they have pride and they don't want to take a selfie with you because you bought them beer. What I'm trying to do is use my following to. At a minimum. Hero, the people that build this country, the plumbers, the carpenters, you know, the concrete guys, the electricians, the sheet rocks, the painters, the roofers, you know. A lot of these guys put their life online. It's dangerous work. It's hot work. It's or it's cold. Mm -hmm. The conditions are never good. I don't think they get paid enough. Um, right in line with cops and teachers. I have. I don't agree with cur curriculums, but I do think teachers are very important. I think they sacrifice their them, their lives for people in a lot of ways. Because I'm in construction, because I work construction my whole life, it just, I have a heart for them. Yeah, I've been close to them. I've argued with them. I've cursed at them. They've cursed at me. Wrong shit. Like, look, you know, iron workers aren't fucking freaking Boy Scouts, bro. They're not, man. They fight in the hotel rooms and they get drunk in trucks and they, they do, you know, crazy things. But if without these guys, man, the world doesn't run. And because of my background and how I was able to make my first money, I just refuse to forget about those guys, man. And so the whole campaign was about, you know, if you see a guy in work boots, buying his lunch, you can tell he's working, trash guy, anything, any mm -hmm. of these jobs that make the world go. Try your best to see if he'll, you know, tell him, hey, listen, I'm a part of this campaign called Buy Me and the Beard. The guys that make the world go around, would you please let me buy you lunch? Or would you please let me cover that for you? It would mean a lot to me. And that's it, man. Um, that's, that's, I just want to champion these guys more because I don't think they get the credit they deserve. And I don't think people realize how important they are.
But before we go into that, you guys know here on the Ice Coffee Hour, we like to be quick and efficient. And I like to cook, which is not the most quick and efficient thing. And on busy days, I usually just end up going to the nearest fast food restaurant because I don't want to spend time cooking. But hear me out, guys. All of these problems can be solved with one simple answer, and that's our sponsor, Cook Unity. Cook Unity is the first chef to you meal delivery service made up of over 70 chefs who believe that great high quality food should be for everybody, especially, by the way, for parents and entrepreneurs who don't want to spend their time going to the grocery store, spending time in traffic, in line, getting home, making the food, it's time consuming. Or if you're Graham and you're just a bad cook overall. With Cook Unity, meals are delivered fresh, never frozen, and the menu rotates every week so there's always something new to try. Each week, award-winning chefs craft hundreds of globally inspired meals with over seven different dietary preferences including vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. Each meal takes just a few minutes to heat up and I can personally attest just how fresh and flavorful they are. This meal is spicy pulled chicken tacos from Ruben Garcia and it was delicious. Also, Cook Unity's subscription is super flexible and you could pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time. This is great for people like us because we have to travel so much for podcasts. In fact, we're leaving tomorrow and I've got some Cook Unity in the refrigerator. So uh, I'm just saying it helps out a ton. So check out cookunity.com slash ICH or use promo code ICH50 to get 50% off your first order. Again, that's cookunity.com slash ICH or use the link down below in the description to get started today. And now with that said, to get back to the podcast. Why are they underpaid and why don't they get that credit? Well, I think they're underappreciated because it's not a sexy job. Look, man, I've been on dates with girls in my past and I told her that I owned a company that did metal buildings and structural steel and I could just see the look on her face. Like she didn't even understand that I make more money than the guy with the startup that she went out with the night before. You know what I'm saying? It's like nobody associates any kind of status or any kind of respectability to it. And I have my thoughts on what really makes it hard for him. I believe that when we went off the gold standard, we went from a guy that could go put a tool belt on and support his family completely to his wife having to work. And I I think that was very negative for the nuclear family. But in regards to how they're being paid, if I were in charge of construction in America or was the president or or, not that I ever would run for anything like that or some kind of office, I would put certified payroll bacon like Davis Bacon projects, which means they have to check the payroll and they assign like an electrician makes this much money with this much fringe benefits and a metal building guy makes this with this much fringe benefits. I would make every project in America that. And one of the big reasons I would do that It's because a lot of contractors, smaller contractors, but contractors nonetheless pay guys cash and don't pay the guys correctly. I'll pay my guys to ride to the project. Well, now the cash I've seen a lot of non-citizens get paid cash. That seems to be the go-to or people that don't want to pay their tax. Isn't that as a to a benefit if someone's request, hey, pay me cash, man. So I'd rather get paid 200 bucks right now than $300 and have to deal with all the IRS. Yeah, I get that. But the problem is that I want to build my, because I'm an American, right? I believe in the American dream. I get a lot of flack for taking up for America, but you don't want to be in America. Get out because America's the goat scoreboard. And I don't mind paying the taxes. I don't mind taking the taxes out and matching it. I would like an equal playing field because what, what is it? So, so my workman's comp for hanging steel is like 45 on a hundred before social security, FICA, Medicaid, everything. So by the time you get close to a 50% labor burden and I'm bidding against a guy for a million dollar job and he beats me by two or 300 grand, I know where it came from. You see what I'm saying? And in regards to paying, paying guys cash, I can't sleep at night trying to build a company on something I could go to jail for. So we pay it like if when they leave my office, from Louisiana to California, let's say, because I got guys from California to New York right now today. They get paid to ride. They get paid their 40 hours straight. They get paid overtime and they get paid per diem and we cover their hotels. But because of that, it makes it hard for me to do jobs, let's say in the South as much Mm -hmm. because the guy next door will pay them cash. But I'm out here talking about having a business and talking about building something that I can count on for a long time, it's not worth it for me to go to jail. It's not worth it for me to have keep an eye open and worry about like getting in trouble with the IRS or the government. It's just not worth it. 
if it were up to me, I would probably give, because you said something a second ago with the Spanish mm-hmm. guys where you said non-citizens, mm-hmm. but if you go on a, on a construction site in America right now and you say everybody that's not originally born in America has to leave, you'd have a site superintendent, you'd probably have an electrician and a plumber, but other than that, and maybe some HVAC guys, the MEPs. Other than that, you'd lose the whole job. Every damn near every man out there is Spanish. And they're coming in and taking the jobs that not Americans want, that Americans don't want. You know, I look, I've got I've got crews of American guys. Mm-hmm. Honestly, they don't perform the same way, but sometimes they can get into an industrial setting. You know, sometimes they can get into an oil and gas plant and it's a slower pace. And but I don't think the Spanish guys are, are taking jobs from Americans that want those jobs. I don't because I don't have I don't have American citizens banging down my doors to come hang steel. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's Americans fault either. I'm not blaming Americans for that. I just think that there's a perception. It's all about what you can be grateful for. Right. Your expectation versus your reality. And I think the average American young man, particularly, is growing up in a world that he feels like he failed if he's not drop shipping from a beach. And it's not cool anymore to be proud of your work. And I, I know those guys are out there in rural towns and stuff. I'm not saying that there's no, let's say, white guys out there, you know, doing their best in construction. But I think by and largely, if an American lands in a construction role currently, uh, especially one where he's not the owner or doesn't have a high paying job or he's not a project manager, he's not particularly. Pr- I get messages every day. Hey, man, I'm trying to get off my tools, you know. Um and I think that I think that we created that in America. But from my perspective, if I hear someone say, I'm in construction, I want to get out of it, I want to, I want to do better, I want to do better for my family, I just hear, I'm not making enough money, it's not scalable, it, it, it takes a brutal toll on my body. Yeah, it I does. I want to do something that I could scale, that I could make money without having to be on the job site all day, which yeah, no, I do I, no, think I get it. Is, is an objective of a lot of people. A thousand percent, but um, also, I mean, it's a one percent for a reason, man. They really wanted that. I think they'd find a way if I'm being fair. Mm -hmm. And then I think some guys love what they do, you know, and there are some Americans out there. I don't want to take this away from all people, but I think everybody in construction knows that a huge portion is Spanish, right? When you say Spanish, uh, you mean Hispanic, right? Like people that speak Spanish? Yeah. So uh, Guatemalans, Panamanians, Mexicans, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I see it in other countries too. Every time I go to Dubai, you know, it, it. it's they're all pulling people from other countries. I'm curious, when did you get into co- the construction business? You you went yeah. to high school. Were you good in high school? You had you were academic and everything. Did you? No, man, I wasn't. I failed sixth grade, bro. You failed sixth grade. I didn't yeah. fail sixth grade. Bro, just yeah, that's <laughs> impossible there's to no, fail. This, this, yeah, there's, there's, there's no, no, like everyone just I gives did. you a it's pass. Not, how on did you sixth fail sixth grade, bro? It's just you know, man. Like no, you know, I I <laughs> like I said, I, home life wasn't the best. Yeah, I don't want to blame them. I wasn't a, even a decent student until really high school. I graduated at three two in high school. I was in the key club, mm, but nice. it was a fight. It was a fight. You, oh, I thought you said you fought. No, it was a it was a fight. Oh. Um, yeah, I got <laughs> plenty. I, thought, I got yeah. I got in plenty of fights in sixth grade. Yeah. Oh, in sixth yeah. grade? Yeah, I got arrested in sixth grade for fighting. Why? What did you get? How? Okay, well, hold on. How did you get into this fight? And then why did you get arrested from this fight? I was, look, well, first of all, let me backtrack. Sounds a little like bit. two separate incidents, right? There. Yeah. Like, got no, fight, how did, how did we go? How did we, no, no, no. It, it was just a fight to, <laughs> to do well in school. I wasn't interested. Okay. I wasn't interested was at I. all. Yeah, was I. Like, and that's why I was talking about the curriculums, yeah. right? Uh, have you ever heard of the book, The War on Boys? Mm-mm. There's this book about basically like how things are not really set up for boys. I'm not a, Ten, tenfold hatter on this or anything like that, but I do believe that when what, what how old are you in sixth grade? Twelve, yeah, yeah something like that. Sure, you really want to sit there and and read like Edgar Edgar Allan Poe? No, no, bro, like it's not interesting. I, I I believe that little boys at that age, if if I could make the curriculums, they'd be changing tires, like learning how to frame a wall, learning how to change some sheetrock. Love that. 
Bro, yeah, I, mean, I would sweet. love that, man. Yeah. Right. How put to that, draft put up a to... contract, dude. Put him to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like actually Slip work. Slip in well, some fine print as... and see if they point okay. it out. Like, as, yeah. as a young kid, yeah. what you're trying contracts. to instill in them, yeah. you're not necessarily giving them knowledge that they can use later in life. You're teaching them how to learn and you're teaching them discipline. Well, it's really critical. Those They're, are the two yeah. things that are actually valuable as a kid, but they've determined that in order to teach kids how to learn and discipline, it's through homework, homework and reading. Ed Edgar well, Allan Poe. I think just like, well, basic reading skills, I think, are important. Mm -hmm. Basic math skills. But Agreed. then I think it's critical thinking. A thousand percent. And I'll tell you yeah, another man. thing, too, is that in America particularly, I can't speak for other countries, but if you're not in a point in your life where you care about the subject, you know, I don't think you're going to hear it. I am more into geopolitics and in social studies today than I have ever been. I watch Wendover videos. I watch Johnny Harris videos, just trying to understand the geo channels. Yeah, yeah bro. He's, he's good, yeah, man. Wendover's uh, great. Wendover's yeah. smoke, bro. And, and like we nerd out, we're sending each other videos about, you know, why the Mississippi river is the most powerful river in the world. Tom and, Scott too. Yeah, yeah. bro. Yeah. Bro. I nerd <laughs> out on these, on this shit sure. at night, man. And, uh, and you could have showed me that video in sixth grade. And I'd have been like trying to pass a note to some little girl or throw paper across the room at my friend that's on the football team or just whatever it was, man. I'm just not interested. But I think if if little boys could do things with their hands, learn how to do things that are going to be helpful in the world, that'll also help the little girls. Now, and I'm not even opposed to teaching little girls how to change a tire. I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying for the little boys, I don't think it's something that they resonate with at that age. And I was just completely checked out. I was thinking about football practice or whatever else, you know, and um, it's certainly not because I'm not intelligent. I just didn't care and I didn't make good grades. I didn't want to do my homework and I sure as hell didn't want to study for a test that I didn't care about. So it was just, you know, one of those things. Now, I was labeled a 504 student. What is you that? Know? I don't know what that it's is. It's like uh, it's like the kind of kid that like needs his test rigged to him. And oh, mm -hmm. God. OK, it is what it is. And I look back at that time in my life. I think it was good for me. So as you're about to hear shortly, running a business smoothly can be fairly challenging. Trying to keep all of your goals, tasks, and data organized among several softwares could be quite confusing and often takes more time than it's worth. Well, if you want to help restructure your business and you don't know where to start, just remember these three numbers from our sponsor, NetSuite. It's 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 because over 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite and stopped wasting time on things like manual data entry and sifting through scattered data. 25 because NetSuite has spent 25 years helping businesses drive down their costs. And one, because NetSuite is an all-in-one solution that allows you to manage all of your KPIs or key performance indicators with one efficient system. NetSuite helps reduce the mistakes of manual data entry. And trust me guys, with manual data entry, there will always be mistakes. And they also help prevent the busy work scaling with your business. So get a full picture of your business and help make better decisions faster. So make sure to download NetSuite's popular KPIs checklist for free right now at netsuite.com slash iced. Once again, guys, it's netsuite.com slash iced and get your free KPI checklist today. Once again, guys, it's free and it's netsuite.com slash iced. Thank you so much, NetSuite, and back to the podcast. But how do you go from there to getting arrested? There's there's a big yeah, okay, gap. The, the, the sixth grade yeah. fight to arrest. I, I, I can't okay. stop thinking about it. I feel like we got to address that. I'll tell you, um... We lived in a, in a neighborhood when, before I moved to this town called Denham Springs, and it was, um, I was like the only white kid. And I learned a lot from the culture of being the only white kid and seeing certain things. And so I, there was a lot of fights in that neighborhood. I moved to this all white school pretty much, and some kid popped off to me and I was hard at that time and I busted him up pretty good. And, uh, what did he say to you? Dude, I can't even remember now. Mm. He was just, how did it, how did it make you feel at the time though? I, I bet you remember the emotions that went through your mind as soon as you said that. It was actually one of those things where it's like, all right, cool. Catch me when you get off the bus. So he lived in the front of the neighborhood. I can't believe I'm even saying this. He lived in the front of the neighborhood <laughs> and he walked from the front of the neighborhood all the way to the back of the neighborhood. And I met him in the street. And, and it was you versus him? Yeah. And some parents broke it up. And you actually like, it was a fight fight. Yeah, of course. Who threw the first punch? Was that you or was he? You're talking to two himself? guys who have, we've never, never been into a well, fight. Well, I've been in a fight. I just lost. Oh. Wait, <laughs> were you actually in a fight? With Michael. Michael Reeves. Oh, that right. Yeah. He did a count. boxing match. Okay. That doesn't, that, really that doesn't count. count. Yeah. Doesn't count. No, so I've never, never been, been into a fight. So I don't, yeah. Oh God, I've been in 
yeah. four or five fights in my adult life. Okay. Oh, but that's actually kind of common in the South. People okay. in the South no, I think the are, quick, there is, are is, quicker is a lot to fight. Yeah. yeah. And look, I'm not championing this shit either. I don't, I'm not sitting here saying it's cool. I don't feel cool or manly to tell you about this. Just in case some- No, we're, some just, we're just we're, curious. No, no, I'm just, tell, yeah. we no, I'm just, no, I'm just telling you, man, because yeah. I know there's going to be always young men watching what I say. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if I can back away from one today, I will. Now, if I can't and you get close enough, I'm going to hit you first. Where do you know the line between walking away and standing up for yourself? We I'll had a you exactly. really yeah. good conversation with Patrick Bet David. Right. And he I saw said, it. If, I actually yeah, watched that episode. If, if the other kid swings first, you got to defend yourself. And that's up to yeah. you. If you can't de-escalate, yeah, there's something, you fight back. There's actually something that you said in there that I would teach my son differently. Sure. And, or, or Patrick said maybe is he has to hit you first. My personal rule is I'm going to tell you I don't want to and I'm going to try to step away. But if you get back in range, there's definitely a jab cross coming. I will definitely hit you first because I don't want to fight you in the first place. And the mistake I made in that bar is after he hit the floor, I tried to grab him by the back. Of the, I dropped to a knee and tried to grab him by the back of the head and really wear his ass out. Mm -hmm. And one of his buddies came up behind me, actually a bit bigger than me. And I just got lucky because I was able to get it. And they were all three trying to hit me, but I was kind of covered up because he was over me. And it's just like, I don't, I don't promote fighting. If I leave here today and somebody tries to fight me and I think I can walk away, I absolutely will, regardless of pride or ego. But when they get you in a corner, I'm not going to wait for them to hit me first. I already know they want to hit me. You know, I've been in enough fights to know what his eyes look like, mm -hmm. what his intentions are. I can see his, his fist balled up, you know? And then you, and then when you actually get in a fight, you get this very shaky feeling inside of you. It's like, it's actually very, you know, it's, it's like a bone chilling feeling. It's the adrenaline coming in your body so you can like not feel things. And, uh, I know what that's like. I know what's, I know when somebody has an intention, I've been in an, I've been in at least 12, 15 in my life. Mm. So I know what it's like. And I'm also not the only time I've ever met somebody for a fight was that fight I was telling you about. Everything else is spur of the moment. Everything else was, you know, boom, boom. And it's over quick, man. Have you ever lost a fight? No, I'm not. Well, th third grade, I got my nose busted. <laughs> yeah, I got my nose busted. You got your nose busted? Your nose bleeding and everything? Yeah, everywhere. Oh, yeah. God. How, how, how that happened? Uh, I got in a fight with this kid. I can't believe we're talking <laughs> this about This is the last <laughs> fight. Okay, last this fight. is the last fight. And then we're going to go to all the inspiring, okay, business building. And then we got other, you know, stuff in store. I didn't know y'all were so interested in the subject. Y'all y'all should have had Tate on. Bro. No, no, keep going. Keep going. Okay. There's this kid messing with my sister on the bus. I did what I did. It went very much in my favor. And then the next day I was walking off the bus and he kicked me and he ran to an open seat and laid down on the seat and started kicking. So when I went to hit no, him, he, he did me. that move. He just that's, laid that's, down. Okay, that's not a cool uh, move. It, it was that like is, a backwards turtle kicking. Right. I know exactly so that I move. Went right into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So whatever. On to the business. Sure. Okay. So, so how did you get into construction uh, at a young age? And then when did the money really start coming in? Yeah. So, um, when I was a little boy, my stepdad did middle buildings and, um, to be quite honest with you, the type of neighborhoods we lived in, there was no lawyers, there was no doctors or anything like that. And we had some house fires when I was a kid and we ended up staying in his boss's house when I was in like seventh grade and we were in a completely different neighborhood. And, uh, it gave me a new consciousness on what was possible because I had not seen a whole lot of that. I always say that construction was the only way we knew how to make doctor money was in boots. And that's actually quite a true thing in South Louisiana, you know, the mouth of Mississippi's air. So there's a lot of industry, there's a lot of industrial work. There's a lot of construction that goes with that work. There's a lot of building houses to support that, that infrastructure of the economy in South Louisiana. And it was the only consciousness I had. I say all of the time, that had I put the same energy into a better business model, a different business model than construction, I think I'd be a lot better off, but I don't think I'd be the same person. And for that, I'm glad I stayed in construction. I graduated college in 2009. I'd already read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I knew I wanted to have a business one day, but I honestly thought I'd end up in Dallas as a project manager first, making really good money and save and, and end up you know, starting something. And those jobs just weren't there. Like we, 
were told when we were freshmen signing up to go into construction management school. And so I dug ditches and I worked for this company called Austin Bridge and Road in this little small town called Bastrop, Louisiana. After I graduated, that job ended. I went to Baton Rouge. I waited tables at Texas Day Brazil in Baton Rouge and I would go during the day and apply for jobs. And um, they were building this hospital called Women's Hospital in Baton Rouge. And um, I'd gone in there a couple of times because they had, they were actually building the project. So instead of going to home office, I was like going on to job sites. And um, the lady's like, I can't let you see the boss. You know, you can't see the boss, like 40, $50 million, some crazy amount. Mm -hmm. Like the third time I went, she goes, hold on. So some grizzly looking, angry white man comes in. He's like, are you Justin? I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, come with me. So I go back to his office and uh, he plops down in his chair and he's like, give it to me. And I'm all like, you know, <laughs> He looks at it, he looks at me, he looks at it, he looks at me, he flops it on the table. He's like, you mean to tell me you've come in here three or four times to stop a $30, $40 million project to see the boss because you want a job? Yes, sir. Well, I like that. Offer me a job. Boom. And uh, I ended up not taking it. I'd went to the company down the street six times. They gave me a job, so I went to New Orleans instead. But what I did there was I was making really good money. It was a levy project for the Corps of Engineers. And so it was like government funded. So we all kind of got paid really well. I was making mm. like 60 grand a year. And so what I did is I went to the bank and I said, listen, I get my, my checks auto drafted, but I want you to push everything but my per diem into this other bank account because I wanted to get a contractor's license. And to get a contractor's license, you had to have a net worth of $10,000, which nor myself or anybody in my family had. It took me about six months, I guess, to get the money saved up. Mm -hmm. And then I went and applied for a residential contractor's license. And then I moved the money to another bank and went and applied for my commercial. And that was 14 years ago, March. Now we have over 200 men, 25 states. We do all of America, the Caribbean. How do you scale that up from working for someone else to then yeah. going off on your own? Is well, it still a requirement, by the way, to have a $10,000 net worth to be a contractor? I think it is in Louisiana. You have to okay. prove it. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Sure. I think it's a good thing. Because it shows like what? Discipline? And well, stuff? just yeah. like that. Well, you're liability. Not not yeah, yeah. Like if you can't get a net worth of 10 grand, 10 grand, then you're probably going to either do some shady shit or not do the right thing or not run the right systems and maybe even hurt somebody just by accident. Construction is really hard with cash flow. Mm -hmm. Like understanding yeah. cash flow, like a whip report, a work in progress. You're billing in excess of cost, cost in excess of billing. Once you start getting in the millions of dollars, you really need to understand cash flow. And, and a lot of guys, like if you can't get a $10,000 net worth, you're not going to understand AR. You're not going to understand retainage and billing and how you really have to play with the big boys to be able to even be a subcontractor. You're really just not. It's, it, and I think that's a good rule. When I started off, I had $2,500 payrolls, like two or three guys. I went to, I never forget my first line of credit was $15,000. First American bank begged the lady to get a line of credit because I had $2,500 payrolls. And at that time, that was a whole lot of money to me. And we were doing these 30 by 40s in backyards. We're doing sheds, man. And uh, I'm 24, 25. So I'd keep a tool belt in the truck for the guys that didn't show up to work. Then I'd put slacks in there so I could go beg for money at the bank and a polo to go try to sell a job. And I did that and I worked out of an F-150 for four years, five years. How are you getting jobs? And what year was this, by the way? This would have been 2011 is when I started. So kind of rough time. I mean, that not was, the easiest time. No, because that was the, the lowest point for housing. It was yeah. 2011. Yeah. Um, but we were doing metal buildings. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I would do that. And then I eventually got to a place where. I knew I needed more systems. And so I got really heavy into E-Myth and I worked with E-Myth for about a year and a half. What's E-Myth? E-Myth is a book by Robert E. Gerber. It talks about the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. And so having that insight for me was actually really important because I had a really good understanding of what I had to be to my business and what did I, what did I need to replace myself with? I needed a really, really good technician to really help me you know, with the guys and because the buildings were getting bigger and bigger and more complex. So when you go from the backyard to doing a school project in New Orleans, it's no longer columns, purlings and girts. It, it can be CMU block with embeds and trusses. It can be 
a normal metal building, but there's a standing seam roof now. There's a valley. And so there's these all these intricate details that now I can literally in my mind see. But it's only because damn near every roof I did for the first three years of commercial leaked. I, and and I had to go get all these certifications. I had to go to Pennsylvania to get certified to do Butler MR24 roofs, which are on every Costco in America, by the way. I had to get go to do the new core, you know, test to make sure I knew how to put their roof on because every manufacturer has a little bit of a different detail so they can get their, you know, their patent on it. Mm-hmm. And so in the specs that the architect writes, which is, again, completely different than doing a backyard Mueller building, you have to be qualified to do these roofs because a lot of times they have what's called a no dollar 20 year warranty on it, which means the manufacturer comes out with a feeler gauge, a camera and anything he can to poke holes in it and take a bunch of photos. And they make these 20 page reports and they're like, no, you have to do this, this and this and this, and they'll hold your money until you do it. And so making the jump from the backyard to commercial, I took some blows. How do you get jobs like that? Cause those are pretty substantial jobs. Yeah. So I'll tell you exactly what I yeah. did. So I, Sought out mentors, I would say around 26. There's this organization called the Metal Building Contractors Directors Association. Shout out to Sasha. and It's a mouthful to say. Could you say that again? Metal Building Contractors and Erectors Association. <laughs> I'm still a part of it. The way that flows. And so I, I sought out mentorship and there was guys at companies, like there's a company in New Jersey named Thomas Phoenix, Sean, Eric, Gary. They really took me under their wing. They were really good to me. They really helped me. And they gave me a proposal template. And um. I took their name off of it, put mine on it, made sure I understood it, but it made me look big on paper. We weren't big. We had like two trucks, you know, but it made us look big. It made us look legit. And then I know that every project has a pre-job walk. And so that means that every general, so, cause we work for general contractors, right? So a big GC, we do the steel. We only do steel, right? We don't do everything else. That's general. So we work for GCs. So I knew that the architects made the GCs do a pre-job walk before, like if they don't show up to that, they can't bid it. So I started calling the architects and asking for the pre-job walk form because I knew like two GCs at this time. So I might get one invite out of 10 general contractors for the same job, or I could find out everybody that's bidding it and non and just send my bid anyway. So what I ended up doing is making what we call now a pre-qualification package, which was like a company resume. Right. And um, I would send them a bid and say, hey, I know bid day is crazy. Good luck. I hope y'all kill it today. But instead of building up, bidding a hundred thousand dollar job to one GC, I'd send it to 10. And I had scenarios where. I would win the job and then the GC that didn't win would have steel on the ground and need somebody. And so I ended up getting on all these people's bid lists. And when I did that, I hired an estimator. And then we built a very strong system around every panel we put in, every kind of column, a framed opening on the steel, a framed opening on sheeting the wall, the trim out, everything. So the, the spreadsheet I worked on for years, just fine tuning every little thing to spit out man hours, because what's dangerous in our business, if people will square foot something, but if it has 47 windows in it, you're going to be there an extra two or three weeks. You know, so for every little thing that we at any kind, any kind of material we've ever installed, we have a man hour budget to put in set amount per day. And that way I could trust that if my estimator, which was like a 55 year old man at the time, and he was, he was with me for like six, seven years. If he just puts the data in correctly, if he just sees the drawings correctly and reads the details that it would spit me out a number that was competitive. And so what he would do is he would send me three or four a week. And we ended up getting to where we're bidding three to five a week, every week. And what I would do is I was running between jobs. I was like my own general superintendent at this time. He would be back in the office. I'd be visiting all the job sites all over the place. And uh, I'd pull over, still Wi-Fi off my phone, open a MacBook, go over it with them on speakerphone, look at the drawings with them, just a double and triple check. And, um, we'd spit three to five bids out a week and then we started doing millions in revenue. And then I had my next problem is scaling the manpower and then making sure the systems 
put me in a place where I could trust that the work would be done correctly. So even today we have what's called a project process. Every mistake we've ever made, ever made from unloading the truck to shaking the steel out to hanging the steel to sheeting the walls, to putting the roof on, to seaming the roof, to blowing the roof off, to putting the gutters on and making sure that we don't cut the gutter for a downspout where subsurface drainage is coming up, let's say, because they're not going to move it from out of the ground. So guess who's got to buy a new gutter yeah. if it's one foot off? All these things that have happened, right? That list is there and it's every mistake we've ever made. And we run that list to make sure our QC runs well. And then of course we have uh, safety. We have a safety guy. And we have a girl that makes sure that they turn JSAs in every day. And that when the time sheets are turned in or if they go into the app, T-sheets, that it's coded to the right thing. Because one of the most powerful things that you can possibly have in construction is historical data for estimating. So that spreadsheet I was talking about with those man hours factors, for us to know how correct they are, it makes a lot of sense for us to be able to have really strong books. And I think having strong books in construction, particularly trade construction, is one of the most important things a guy could do. Because if you don't know the historical data of what got you to the profit or not profit on the job, then you're going to make the mistake again. Yeah. How often are you unprofitable on the jobs? Because I'd imagine, mm -hmm. and I've seen it before, where a contractor will bid a job, it'll be yeah. a bid under, and if they're held to it, sometimes we're losing money because they just underestimate how much work I've, goes into something. I've lost money on a bunch of jobs, man. Yeah. In fact, in that phase, in that growth phase, it would really look like this. Make a bunch of money, break even, break even, lose money. Make a bunch of money, break even, lose a little bit, make a little bit, lose money. It, it was, it, and that's really, it was really around scaling. Mm -hmm. You know, you got this one guy that's like your ace and you want to put them on the best jobs you can and you still have guys not showing up. You still have mud on projects. You still have steel showing up incorrectly. You have forklifts breaking down. You have man lifts breaking down. You have trucks stolen. You know, I, I, it's nothing for me to get a call on a Sunday and be like, the guy's just gotten a big bar brawl in Michigan and cops are looking for trucks with your logo on it. Sweet. These things happen. It, right. it is construction. And so just like getting, like planting seeds with men, cutting the bad ones, keeping the good ones, planting seeds with men, cutting the bad ones. And now I have three good ones. Now I have four. What makes them bad? And can you spot that ahead of time when hiring? Are there red flags that you see in people yeah. where it's well, like, oh, I could kind of tell this might go there. I can tell you when it turned around for sure. me. Uh, I created a system around hiring. I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni's books. So he's got the ideal team player, which is a very cool book. It's actually about trying to find a construction guy. And, and that's just mm -hmm. by coincidence. But he's got, hum he's got this thing called Humble Hungry Smart. But what we start with is proven competence. I used to would run ads for guys and they would call, they would lie about how long they've been doing it. They've been working at the competition for three months and they tell you they've been there five years and they'd want to leave you to get a raise or whatever it is. And um, so what I did is I was like, okay, well, I need to be recruiting at least 1.25% more than I'm bidding. And I always draw a circle on the, on the board at my office. I'm like, bids, recruiting, and then the projects right in the middle. And so what I did is I created very loaded metal building questions that you would only know if you've been doing it for quite some time. After we've proven competence, I think the best part of this, this phone process starts. Humble, hungry, smart. Would you be willing to work under another form and to learn our systems for a little while until you learn how we do it? Cool. That's, that's, you know, a big question. Would you be willing to work for a dollar an hour less for the first month so we can see you're as good as you say you are? Hungry. Would you be willing to leave town and work weekends if we need you to, to hit a schedule? Smart. Tell me what you don't like about your current company. We're trying to get them to talk shit. Like we're truly trying to get them to, like we, we really push them so on this one. Test if they, if they talk yeah. shit, if they talk like, shit, they're out. But then again, they're trying to be honest with you. If you ask them what you don't like, yeah, but I've do done, I've done, I've done, I've done enough. Like I've done honest. because yeah. they'll run with it. Sure. They will run with it. And there's a big difference between, you know, I don't really like it here. I don't feel like I get treated very well. I'll leave it at that. Or I don't see growth here. Um, and I've not, 
maybe maybe they haven't come through on the promises they gave me. You know, things like that yeah. versus sure. these MF, they're trash, blah, blah, yeah. blah. They're idiots. The, one, yeah. the guys in the office are morons. They don't know how to estimate. Bro, the last thing I need in my business <laughs> is that guy talking to my guys, yeah. right? And then luck. We ask them how their luck is. How are things going for you? How's your life going? And when you have guys that come to you telling you how unlucky they are, they will bring that bad luck into the company. Mm. And what I do, because I'm not on these calls, and neither is my operations manager. So have you ever heard of the Fibonacci series? No, I have not. So it's like this concept that most things in nature are an odd number and that humans struggle seeing the difference between two and three. We can definitely see the difference between one and five, five and nine, nine and 13. But you can feel the difference. And so let's say we get to the question about hungry. Are you willing to work out of town on short notice or work weekends if we need you to? Well, yeah, I mean, I could do that for y'all if, if you really needed me to. Or, yes, absolutely, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'm here to work. Completely different answer. Both yes. Mm -hmm. Because they'll tell you whatever they, they need you to hear for them to get a job. But the flexion in their voice, because I'm not on the call, I can't hear it. But she rates, using the Fibonacci series, how much of a yes it was. So 13 being the highest. And then the total score is anybody over a certain score gets to talk to Renee and she's our operations manager. And that's how we weed out. If, if, I if we talk to 100 guys, Renee will talk to five or six maybe. But I get rid of all the lies. I get rid of all the drama. I get rid of any incompetency lies just by these five categories and how they tell you yes or no but then how do they squeak by let's just say they get accepted they start the job but then after a month or two you realize hey, it's not working out how do they squeak by that and what do you notice on the job that they're lacking is it maybe discipline are they just not focused enough is it are right. they not detail oriented enough how do you spot these things it'll be safety quality production okay well no if they're getting kicked i've got like if they're getting kicked off of jobs for not tying off when they know damn good and well they should be they sign a, they, they put a JSA together every day. Um, if they're not hitting man hours, I have enough men now that if a guy tells me he put a thousand square foot of roof on in a day, that something's not right. You know what I'm saying? We have enough jobs in our, we've done thousands of buildings, millions of square foot of buildings all over America. We know like our man, our man hours factors are, they're solid now. We know what they're supposed to do. And then quality. If they don't want to read the detail, you have to know and you have to get it right because if it fails inspection, then you're looking at an insurance claim of possibly ripping a roof up mm. or massive amount of extra man hours for getting this thing in a place where the manufacturer will actually give the customer that warranty because we put it in correctly. And 99% of the time, if a, if a roof leaks, 99.9999% of the time, it is a rector error. We are erectors and those are engineers and they have tested this in all conditions. So if we don't do the detail correctly, they will not insure the roof. And if they don't insure the roof, the architect won't sign off of it and they won't buy it. I'd love to get a little bit more into the self-development stuff because you've been also talking about that a lot recently, I feel like, how you have to get fit, you have to start earning a better living, making more money to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. As somebody watching this right now that maybe doesn't wake up and feel super happy with where they're at in life, what would you recommend they do to start becoming the best version of themselves? Get in shape. That is the number, that's number one, one thing. I put it in front of making money. I really do. I think that being in shape gives you an advantage in business. I believe that truly. I think people respect you more. I think people look at you and they say, they, you, it's like walking discipline, walking strength. I look, it might not be a popular thing to say, but a physical stature on a man when he walks into a room and his ability, like I said, to look you in the eye and body language, it garners respect and it, in my opinion, can get you further in business. People, people want to work with people they respect. So fitness first, number one, if you're not in shape and you're eating bad and you're not moving your body, 
then your whole, all your cells are stale. Like you can't even think straight. So I always put getting in shape above everything. You know, I believe that a person that does really well in life and is not in shape would have done better if they were in shape. You know what? On that though, that's the one thing you can't fake. You can't fake being in shape. You can't yeah. fake a six. I mean, I'm sure you could fake a six pack, but it seems as though that's the one thing that all these billionaires are doing is like all of a sudden they all seem to be getting in shape, getting six packs. Yeah. Because when you have all the money, in the, like you can't necessarily buy that stuff. That's just purely dedication, discipline, and right. a lot of work. And so that to me now seems like the ultimate flex is being really in shape. Thousand percent. And, it, and it's one of those, you know, you could be a very rich guy and walk through the grocery store and nobody would know. You can't say that about fitness. You get to carry that with you everywhere you go. It gives you an advantage, whether it's with the opposite sex, business, or even how you feel about yourself. It's easy to respect yourself when you put in the work to get in shape, you know, because it's hard work and it shows. So I, I, for me, that's number one on the list. Uh, some people would probably put money in front of it. I just personally don't because I just think you'll do better at business if you're in shape, particularly. It's also free. Yeah, it is. It's costing you. Thousand percent. Yeah. And it doesn't take as much time as people say it does. You know, I remember being in high school, man. I worked at Harbor Freight Tools. You know what that is? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I would go in the back in the bathroom and I'd put the little sales papers down on the bathroom floor <laughs> to do push ups <laughs> until I couldn't do them anymore. You know, and I did that for years and years and years, you know, and um, it really pays off now because at 37, I've had six shoulder surgeries on this shoulder and a total replacement. And I have mature muscle left over from 20 years of exercising. And so now I, I don't let myself get any further than two weeks out from being able to turn, take my shirt off anytime I want. You know, I keep abs year round, but it was all that work I did, especially when I was young, you know, like people, people should start working out at an early age because your body is maturing and growing at that time. And you can create all this bone density, all this mature muscle that will stay with you over time, especially if you just do the work to keep the maintenance on it. I don't work out the same way I used to. My shoulder really won't allow it. Some days it really hurts the box, you know? So I have to work on footwork all day or, you know, defense or whatever. But I don't think there's a thing in this world that you could do for yourself. I can't think of one that's better than getting in really good shape and getting strong. I just made me want to hit the gym. Yeah. Well, you need to. <laughs> you got you need it. to. No, I do yeah. hit the gym. I do go. I went, yeah. I went today. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. But how do you maintain a six pack year round? What is that like? Because that seems to me like you're disciplined every meal. Like, well, I'll tell you, every how, day. I'll tell you how I personally do it is I've had a six pack since I was 24 years old. There's not been a day between 24 and now where I could not see all of my abs. Now I might get puffier around the love handles. You know, like if, if you have a standard you know, sometimes I'd be here, sometimes I'd be here, but I'd never get too far. Imagine if there's a straight line and there's a line above it and below it. I never got outside that. I would never let myself get outside that range. And it's super easy to keep it once you get it. And even though this is not true, I try to tell young men to believe that whatever you get today, you'll keep it forever. It'll make you work out harder. So you get the most you can. But the way I do it now is I, fa I, I fast every day. I've still not eaten today. What? I haven't eaten. No. Last what, time I, what time do you wake up? Today? Yeah. Five o'clock. AM? Yeah. And it's like seven? It's coffee something? 30, bro. <laughs> coffee. How, how and do you I'm, get by all day and, without eating? And I, I get headaches. I'm I feel used to like it. scattered. I'm used to it. Focus. I fasted through breakfast and initially it was a little tough, but mm. now it's very easy. And I, I don't even think about it anymore. Yeah. I feel like you just get used to it. I don't even think about it. And so what do you have? Just one meal at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah. And then what time do you go to bed? Probably from 10 to 12 on a normal day. So you're eating and then going to bed right afterwards? I heard that's bad for you to eat like right before you go to bed. Yeah, everything's, you're sleeping bad. And everything's bad for you. What do you eat? What's a normal dinner look like for you? Protein. S steak or chicken or whatever. But I'll eat carbs too. Yeah. Do you track shit. calories or no. just like the one meal? Like no. I can do whatever I want to. If I don't eat Yeah, if day, I want to, I'll eat pizza. Meal. I'll eat pizza if I want to. Yeah. But I mean, and I'm and a lot of people when they fast their goal is to trigger like an insulin response, right? That's actually not what I'm trying to do because I'll drink the little five hour energies or the feel freeze. You ever try one of those? No, they got like, I just stick with coffee. They got like mock and stuff and I drink coffee too, but um, I know the coffee won't trigger the insulin, but 
even like a fake sweetener can kind of tell the brain or the gut, like, you know, you have sugar in you. I do it for pure mathematical purposes. There's no way I can eat 2,500 calories between 8 PM and 10 PM. Like it's almost impossible. So for me, it's more about a deficit than it is about like messing with my insulin response or anything like that. Like I don't nerd out on it. I definitely think there's like an 80, 20 to fitness, you know, even, even in the way that I work out, I genuinely, like I only do certain lifts because I know that I'll get the biggest return from those lifts. And what is that? So for example, I'll never do flat bench or D or, um, decline bench. Sure. I do all upper chest. When you walk into a room or you're outside, there's one constant variable and that's overhead light. And a lot of particular, like having a six pack or looking big is an illusion based off light. So I focus all on my upper chest because when you walk in a room, that's what people are going to see. And it also pulls the rest of your chest up. When I do abs, I only do the bottom two abs. Seems oddly specific. How, how, how well, well let me, it? let me, let me clarify. Yeah. How many guys have you met? To like, oh, I got the top two. Bro, my fucking grandma's got the top two. It's your ribs, <laughs> I asshole. I only have Dude, the top I, two. I, I exactly. Know. Come on. Man. Exactly. But. Better call me out. How do you- but <laughs> if you do decline weighted abs, like with a 45 on your chest, and you only focus on the bottom two, and you tilt your head back so you isolate it, nobody in history of the universe has ever had the bottom two in this v taper and not have the top two i treat my abs like i would treat my bicep you ever seen a guy that's super lean skinny even Mm -hmm. and he not have a six-pack i've known plenty of guys like this and so the reason i say this and that you have to treat it like your bicep is that you need to get a pump in your abs and what that allows you to do. So as the skin goes down and that muscle is growing, go back to overhead light, that muscle poking through the skin is what creates the shadow underneath. Yeah. And so the bigger you can get them, and it's kind of like that girl thing, like, bro, you're not gonna, your abs aren't going to get huge overnight. You're not going to look like you have a huge gut. Shut the fuck up. Try to get a pump where you can literally feel a physical pump in your abs and they poke through the skin. And even you, bro, you can have a six pack at 12, 14% body fat sometimes. And then when you start to actually lean down, then you get really fucking ripped because it's poking through the skin and protruding. You know, it, you kind of get that 300 look. I'm telling you, you'll have a six pack faster than you would any I other way. Try that. It's an absolute cheat because it pokes through the skin and it creates a shadow. You know, I'm telling you. So look. Is this cred credit right here? Well, I could I could just show y'all, but I feel like that'd be turbo douchey. <laughs> <laughs> so turbo. That's funny. Yeah, so you want you want them to poke out. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? But see you got the V thing going They're like on. Like screaming the sides. at me. It's like how do you get the side bit too? Here, I, yeah, you also airdrop this to me just so I can show the view. Is that cool if I show yeah, cool, the viewers cool. that photo? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just so you can you guys save it. gotta see this okay trust yeah. me. <laughs> on the obliques one thing i would say you could do and i did this a lot early on is you ever do a side plank yeah okay cool go up and put your hand on them mm-hmm. make sure it burns and when it finally starts to burn bounce pulse on that bitch fuck it up like like want to destroy it. I used to do that two minutes at a time on each side and I just, until it hurts so bad. And it's just, cause those are really small muscles mm-hmm. and people are like, Oh, if you do that every day, dude, I do abs every time I have this thing I call Lima bean theory and Lima bean theory is for abs. You ever see a guy go to the gym and he says, okay, we'll do abs when we're done. But what happens is he goes in there, he does shoulders or whatever he does. Right. I use this for actually abs and legs. He gets this big pump, and then after the fact, when he's supposed to do abs, lima beans. Me every single time I go to yeah, the Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have to change that. Lima bean theory is you're sitting at the table, your mom made macaroni and cheese, chicken nuggets, and these stupid-ass fucking lima beans. Just eat the lima beans first when you have the most energy, pre-workout, excited to be there, whatever. Get it out of the way. Then you can enjoy the chicken nuggets and the macaroni and cheese. You know, it's like goes back to yeah, eating as a do kid. It first. Do it first yeah. because you're not going to do it after. I'll give you another example. Tricep. I don't want to start flexing in here, but I kind of, I kind of want to. No, no, flex, but flex, so, flex. So like 
I only work on this inside. You see that little horseshoe and that horseshoe? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I only work on those because any asshole that ever does triceps ever is going to get this line right here. So I purposely, I'll take my thumbs and a rope. I'll do skull crushers, heavy. But I'll take my thumbs with the rope and turn it out. And I'll even stand up. I'll take that, you know, the little ball that comes on the little yeah, cord. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that ball and I'll put it between my fingers like this. And I'll turn and I'll purposely go over the back. So I hit this guy. Jesus. You understand? I mean, that, yeah, yeah. And with the bottom two abs. <laughs> so it's like, dude, you got three workouts. Yeah. Upper no, chest no, but that's, that's not, that, it's not completely true. I know, I know. Because I I still, I'll still shrug. Yeah. Right? When I do my biceps, I'll, you know how like there's, you know, the weight, the weight and the handle. Uh-huh. I'll push my hand all the way to the inside and I'll twist it like as far as I can out to create that peak. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so like Rambo, for example, I think he shot Rambo at like 158 pounds, but he looks 220. It's all a fucking illusion. If you can develop the right muscles. Now, of course, rep range is important. So I do 12, 12 working sets of eight as heavy as I can possibly do. And then I'll rep to fail twice. You do no. a lot. Well, it's not really a lot. It's five sets. And I would also, I did a lot of rep to fail pushups coming up. Now, I've heard the reason you're not supposed to do that and like isolate certain muscles is because of injury. So like when you go and you kind of lift, let's say for your shoulder or what's that? He's trying to block it out. What is that? I don't know if that, what does that mean? I don't only, get it. only pussies will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Bro, people. <laughs> like, what is yeah. that? <laughs> Neither of us have any clue. <laughs> I thought it was like some Illuminati. <laughs> yeah. Damn. What? Are you a part? Huh? You're part of the Illuminati? What? No, bro. What? You're not a no, part? Um, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm probably accused of it. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. By the way, I've been doing my hands like this for years. Okay, no, no, no. That's what I want to know. Okay, because yeah. I was actually going to point that out. Everyone's <laughs> been doing this. Okay, even Bro, I, I'll I, notice dude, myself doing that. I swear accent. to God, Andrew could tape himself wiping his ass <laughs> and it would catch on. Really? So I don't know, bro. I mean, but literally. Did you get that from Andrew? Did he? No, bro, I, you know, it's so funny. Before I ever met Andrew, oddly enough, there's a picture of me at a war room event before I met Andrew sitting like this, looking at the guy talking. A lot of people do this. Really? Andrew made I it cool, so. bro. Andrew made it cool. Bro, it's super comfortable. You've never done this? I do. I, I catch myself doing it, but I'm like, oh God, like, is this just uh, because- Is this because of Andrew? Is it yeah, in my subconscious? I don't know. Yeah, bro. You know, look, <laughs> I've been doing it for a long time, bro. <laughs> I'm not going to quit. in the Illuminati, what they would say, though. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe, but yeah, there's conspiracy theories that, everywhere. Mm-hmm. But anyway, back to what we're saying. Sure. I also do, I do heavy weight. I believe in doing heavy weight. I'll do weighted pull-ups. I'll strap a 45 around my waist and do pull-ups and things like that. And then I'll rep to fail after, you know, um, I don't claim to be a fitness guru, but I, I do think that there's some very obvious muscle groups that will give you an advantage and give you a huge return on investment of time. And I clearly don't skip leg day. So mm-hmm. that's how I look at it. Yeah. So do you think for most guys, it's better to go to the gym purely for, you know, physically being in better shape? Or do you think it, it, it's better for the health reasons. I think everything. Sure. I think mating, business, health, bone health, longevity, aging. Motivation. Everything, man. Everything. I When I think about working out when it comes to energy particularly, I think about you're doing that work and you're like cranking. Like you're like a little, yeah, a little like toy a car. The dial, yeah, yeah, the yeah. dial. And like you come out in like this euphoric state, especially if you really went after it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I do believe in, in lifting heavy and then repping to fail. People are like, oh, you rep to fail. You're going to burn your muscles down. It's like, it's like when girls say, I don't want to work out because I don't want to get big. It's like, look, sweetheart, like, I don't know what made you think that your genetics are better than every dude in your gym that's working out every day and he's still not big. Like with one tenth of his testosterone. You're not going to get jacked. Get in the squat rack. So, um, I, I do, and I call them pinpoint muscle groups. So I only work out these certain muscle groups. I probably don't do in a year any more than ten or twelve lifts. Hmm. Like all these people that are mixing it up. 
in like doing kettlebells. I fucking hate kettlebells. kettlebells uh, you won't catch me dead doing kettlebells. A kettlebells, bro. <laughs> if I if you catch me doing kettlebells, please kick me in the nuts. Like it's the dumbest shit on the planet. It's fucking retarded. Liver King sent us a whole bunch of kettlebells. Yeah, so Liver King head. also lied about a bunch head. of shit. But he he yeah. does the kettlebells for different reasons. He does barbarian. You know what the barbarian workout is? No. You should try it. No. Oh, dude, I I carried. It was horrible. I he sent them. And I was like, I'm going to just try to see. Would you I put can't. your hands in them or something? Yeah. So, so you hold, yeah. I think it's 70 pound kettlebells in each uh, hand. Yeah, I guess it was pound? 70. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, you have 20 pound ankle weights on each leg. Uh-huh. You have, what is it, a hundred or so pounds in, in a backpack. backpack. And you're Going dragging sled. a sled that has like, I think 135 pounds. And you have to walk a mile and you can't sit. That's fucking retarded. <laughs> Why would you say that? Because I'm not trying to be a tri- triathlete. I'm trying to be jacked and explosive. Like, that's dumb. I feel like... Where's the hypertrophy in that, really? Your calves, maybe? Like, you you might get lean that way. Okay, cool. But we're talking about putting on muscle. I think his thing wasn't so much It was just that. like, I'm going to push myself. It was, it was I think mental, he's on so much gear, it doesn't mental, matter what he does. It was mental endurance. I think that's what it was. Oh, for that, I, for push, that I'm cool that, with it. Yeah. If, if, if he's I going the David Goggins meant. route, yeah, I think it, honestly, like, it, and it's like a mental fortitude thing. He says like a rite of passage. But let's not bullshit. Like, like... Ideally, you would look like a pro athlete, let's say. I think that's the greatest compliment I've ever gotten is when somebody asked me who I played for. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, yeah, well, that's a long time over, and I don't like to be Uncle Rico, but thank you. What is it like yeah. living life as someone who's 6'4"? It's like being dealt at least two aces. Really? Yeah, bro, for sure. You're born straight, white, male, and tall. Bro, that's at least three aces out of five, you know? You I, think it's that big of an advantage to be 6'4"? And- no. No, I would never like, I don't think just because you're tall, you get ahead in life, but I mean, there are certain advantages to it. And I think Mm -hmm. I'd be a kid to say that that's not true. What are some of the biggest advantages you would say? Girls, the ability to play sports, um, a certain physical presence in a room. I think it's helped me in leadership a bit, but I don't think it, I don't think it makes me a better leader. You know, I just think it's helpful. But not no. planes. Not good on planes. No. <laughs> not good on planes. Not good in Lamborghini. Okay. Right, 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 right. So, so no sports cars, but you can reach the top aisle, top shelf at the grocery yes. store. Yes. So that, Absol- that I need help. That's sometimes. good. Okay. I can absolutely do that. Right. You know, there's an obvious thing that I can stay that Graham can stand on his wallet. Right. You know, which it is what it is. But you know what also? I've thought about this deeply, actually. If I had not been so tall or would not like gifted so much like physically, I might have created a different strategy in my life and been much better at something else. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. I a hundred percent actually agree with you. Yeah. Like I would have been like, okay, you can't play this card in life. You need to hyper focus here. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think life is really like that. I think that life is, you know, evaluating the hand you're dealt and then saying, okay, how can I maximize this? Because everything that's ever happened negative in my life or any disadvantage that I think I have, like I'm quite dyslexic. Like I don't read very well at all. Mm. My word, my eyes just don't pick the words up. Yeah. It could be a simple, it could be like a child's book and like, I just, the, whatever the eye flow is, it just doesn't work out very well for me. And I'm like, okay, well, what can I do about it? You know? So I've, I've been able to turn most negative things in my life into positive somehow. And I think winners do that. I mean, most people, if they have something that seems to be a disadvantage, I try to wait, find a way to make it a superpower. I really do. You know, like I didn't grow up in the best situation. Like I grew up trailer parks and stuff like that. But for that reason, I believe I had this certain kind of grit or understanding of the world or, or whatever mm-hmm. that I, I choose to believe, whether it's true or not, gives me an advantage. And that's just how I choose to frame it. Do you think there's a disadvantage of being really tall? I think much taller than me, you start to look like a baby giraffe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. You know, I, that's like, okay. But, I, the, but you said much taller than you. I mean, so like, what about any, being like, six foot four? Is there, okay. is there any disadvantage? I would cut it off at six four. You I think, think <laughs> that's the optimal height? Six four. Six three, six four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think six five and definitely six six, you start to look goofy. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's because then they get long. Like it was hard for me to get size because of my height. I had to work extra hard on like working out to get size on me because my, my limbs are long. And then once you get to six, six, it's just kind of weird looking. 
You know, you're just so much taller right. than everybody. But if that's the optimal, what downsides have you seen for being yourself? tall? Yes, for yourself. Besides I've had, not I, okay, fitting Lamborghinis. Okay. I, I am curious. Yeah. Are, I fit in my Lamborghini. <laughs> okay, okay, it's good. close. Okay. Are there certain yeah. girls that are like, mm, no, you're too tall at six feet? Hell four. no. Hell no. No, I've never had that a girl That does tell not me happen? No. In fact, I see, bro, you see it a lot, man. This is actually something that people talk about online a lot. It's like girls will put, if you're not six foot tall, like swipe left. Oh, they do. They yeah, do. and I yeah. think that's ruthless. Yeah, but, th but that's all on social media. Once they meet someone shorter in person, I've seen it firsthand, it goes out the door. It's like when they're on social media, yeah. Tinder, there's so many options. Yeah. They have to do things they're, to filter. There has to be to, like a minimum something trying, on there. They're trying to vet. But yeah. I think I think it just depends on on the girl or the guy in the situation. Mm. But no, I've never, I've never been high. I, well, I tell you, I've had a lot of people in my life come to me and say, when I first saw you or met you, I hated you. But after I got to know you, I realized I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think that sometimes I might look like a guy that used to pick on them in high school or something. And I was the nicest person on the planet in high school. Like I was class favorite. Like I was at my 10 year reunion was a, one of the best days of my life because people would come up to me and they said, you were very popular, but you're always nice to me. And it means a lot. And it was just like one of the best days I've ever had in my life because it was very fulfilling to hear that, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years later. But I have had people judge me based off of my appearance and come to find out later it wasn't positive. I mean, I think my height was probably included in that. I definitely think like from seeing you online and also seeing you in person, you are a bit intimidating, I would say, based off of your stature, yeah. based off the muscles. And also based off of like just the way that you walk and the way that you show yeah. yourself. I've been on told that a lot. Yeah. And on top of that, your stare is yeah. very intense. <laughs> like when you look at me, your eyebrows, they yeah. furrow and they kind of sit yeah. low on I, your forehead yeah, I, and you're like, like lasers. Very serious. At very so that, serious. And you're, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just an intense look, which it, I personally, I don't have a problem with, but I'm trying to understand. Is that something yeah. that you learned over time, like through business, you had to have this intense eye contact or have you always had this was like high level of focus? Well, it was probably construction probably amplified it and then also um i do think it's very important to like let people know that you're truly like i think you can shake a man's hand and look him dead in the eyes and he'll know if you're a snake or not because if you can't look him dead in the eyes how can he trust you in my 20s when i'm shaking some 55 year old white guy's hand and telling him i'm going to hit his schedule and i had to do that to be able to get a contract for a metal building or to hang these steel jobs um, yeah, it was probably something that I acquired just out of necessity because I was the youngest guy in the room and I was lucky because I was tall because I looked like a grown ass man, you know, coming, coming, cause I played college football. And so I came into my business, man, I was, you know, six, four, two forty. Mm. you know, six, three, six, four. I'm a little over six, three barefoot, you know, like six, three and a half barefoot. And, um, and so, yeah, I, th I think it was an advantage, grow a little bit of a beard out mm -hmm. and just look people dead in the eye, especially in the construction meetings. Cause every Tuesday in commercial construction, you, you know, have a subcontractor meeting. I was very often the youngest guy in the room. And so I had to use kind of a quiet disposition in body language to be able to set the tone with basically a room full of men that were older than me, been doing it for longer than I've been alive. On top of being in shape, what would you say are the next things that guys should put high up on there? I would say, value tier list so it's like getting in shape would be like s tier top tier like I, i'll put these two next to one another actually because they're really important but your financial education it's huge obviously like guys like you no, i agree with that you know and then understanding female nature truly understanding it understanding hypergamy understanding frame so and, and, explain and hypergamy sure so hypergamy is, is kind of like an evolutionary theory that women will monkey branch socioeconomically across or up only. And that if they're in a position where they could monkey branch up is most often the time they would leave you. I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about how to pick up a woman. I'm not talking about how to like, Hey girl, what's up? How to text. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying understanding female nature and understanding frame with a woman, I think is very important. I think that as much as people want to promote bad bitch culture, that a strong, stoic, not very emotional, understands what he wants, is very direct, takes the lead, opens the doors, takes the male role fully, and a man that understands why that's so important, 
is a man that has a really good opportunity or really good shot at having a long term relationship. I believe that when a woman loses respect for you, she stops loving you. And why would she lose respect for you? Like what would cause maybe that? you're emotional. Maybe you don't provide in the way that you should. Maybe because you don't provide, she is having to go take on a masculine role out in society, possibly even working for another man. And now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a woman in the workplace. Clearly, you know how I feel about it. But I think you need to have a strong understanding of a woman in her actual true nature, not the agenda that's going on right now, but a woman's true nature. I think a woman that is not influenced by bad bitch culture or by <clears throat> promiscuous culture, et cetera, most often, most times, and even the girls that are strikingly beautiful that make a whole bunch of money, I think ultimately they'd like to find a man that they can look up to, that they can submit to, as unpopular as that might be, that they can support on his mission and be a support system to that mission. And they would like a man that would be a leader to them. And I think ultimately they would like to be a wife and I think they'd like to raise children. I don't believe that a huge majority of women want to have these crazy careers. I think there's a lack of good men out there and they have no choice. Even the OnlyFans girls. One thing that I'm getting kind of stuck on out of all of that stuff would be the emotionless thing. Not emotionless. Or Okay, sure. Maybe not emotionless, but not super emotional. Right? Would, would not super. Yeah, so for example... If a woman knows mm -hmm. that she can upset you easily and that you're going to show emotion and act like a child, I believe there should be a bit of dissonance between a man and a woman. Not that men are better, but he should be, she should look up to him in some way. Respect. Respect, right? If she can do the smallest thing and bring him down to almost a child level where they're going to argue, I don't argue with girls ever. So what do you do if you get in a disagreement with someone that you're with? Then we can sit knee to knee and have an adult conversation, but um, there's going to be no yelling. So what's the dis so what's the difference between that and an argument? Is an argument a guy that punches a hole in a wall? Okay, a guy that slams a door. You know, a guy that can't sit and be with her. You know, I I if I'm with a girl, I look at it as my job to be her emotional stable outlet. I say, I've said on many podcasts, I believe a man's job is to be the mountain that a woman's emotional waves crash into. Women are more emotional than men. And when men start acting very emotional, in a lot of ways, I believe he's telling that woman that he can't emotionally handle the situation. And then she loses respect. Look, if he has a hard time at work or something's going wrong or he takes a loss, I don't think she's going to leave him. But I think if he if he acts like a child and very, very emotional, I think she'll start to get nervous and panic because obviously he cannot handle the situation. I do think it's very important for a man to be stoic. Am I saying that a man can't have feelings? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that he should be the strong one. I believe that the genders are different. They're equal in different ways and what loads their value are completely different things. And I think that's completely okay. And I know that if there are more strong men out there, then women could allow themselves to let go and be more feminine. And that's why I really quite enjoy helping young men become strong in every way. What about the hypergamy aspect? Because it does seem like there is this narrative that women are just going to up and leave as soon as they could find something better. Like, I don't think, think that's young. always true. Okay. But I do think frame is very important. Like you, like very non-popular thing for me, I've said in the past is that my girl doesn't go on girls trips. You know, I'm not letting my girl go to Vegas and get drunk with a bunch of girls in a club when there's a bunch of dudes buying bottles all around them. Why would I put her in that position? So we had the same uh, conversation with Fresh and Fit. Yep. I said that if my fiance wants to go with their friends, it's a birthday party yep. and it's at a club, it's a girls thing. I wouldn't be bothered by it. Yeah. I think it really depends on the situation and the intentions. If it's like, hey, a random Friday night and it's like a recurring thing all the time. It's like, oh, but you're not invited, but there's going to be other guys. But you can't. Then, then you, you kind yeah. of feel that there's something yeah. maybe up. 
But I think there's so many innocent times where it's like, hey, just going out and having a good time. Yeah, cool, man. I mean, I, I think it's different, different strokes for different people. And I understand where you're coming from. And I don't think that you're wrong. For me, it's a no-go. Did you know what I've noticed? And I put hard lines in with a woman, particularly around even something like that. I find that they get really turned on by it. It's the weirdest thing. But I think it's the protective part that you're showing. And I think a lot of women want to be accounted for. To me, it seems like they want to be desired. And by you doing that or saying those things or putting that right. boundary, it, it to me conveys that you're valuing them and you don't want to lose them. And, and you want to protect aspect, it. And you're going to aggressively protect it. And that's the other part about well, to me, it's just it's very primal. It's like the seem, fighting thing. It doesn't seem like quite like protecting. It's more so like I really value and you, they're very desired to you. Right. They're very wanted. Right. That, I guess, is the way. And so in that particular scenario, if a woman is just flat out saying, no, I'm going no matter what, she's going to put on her sexiest dress. She's going to put on a push-up bra. She's going to go out. And she's going to look better that night than she probably looked all week at your house around other men. Probably because women's attention is currency. If you really understand women's nature, they like attention. They do. That's okay. But for a woman to go out, dress up, have her boobs out, have her heels on, have her legs showing in a club full of men that are nowhere near me. It's no go for me. But, but how is that different from I'll give a you guy? An, I'll give you a note. Wearing a nice watch, driving a nice car, in shape, yep. well-fitted clothes, walking outside, go to the mall. And just why is he doing that? Is that to impress other guys? Is that to get email Pro attention? Probably all of the, probably all of the above. But I think there's a better example of this: women that put a lot like bikini photos on Instagram. If you're with, especially dude, if you're married and you have your titties out on Instagram, that's a no go. And I feel like men mess up with the frame part of that. Um. Because if you're, if you're putting yourself online in that way, you are trying to garner attention in some way. And you're trying to get that attention outside your husband. And so I can tell you that is something I absolutely wouldn't put up with either. And it's, it's, it's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of different ways I feel like a man can get what Byron or Walt or even my would call a shit test from a woman. You know, but uh, being friends with your ex, guy friends in general. There's not a guy friend that exists that doesn't want to sleep with a woman. I can't, I, it, in, if it were the case, then why don't guys have fat girl friends? They generally don't. You don't see, do you have, you know, a guy that has a friend that's a girl is obese? I don't. And if the opportunity was presented to that man, he would sleep with her a thousand percent of the time. Guys play friend zone game all the time. So I don't put up with any girl that I'm seeing. So you, exes are guy friends. I so don't do it. Your logic is to protect the woman. You will draw these lines in the sand, yeah. establish these boundaries in mm -hmm. order to protect the woman or to protect the relationship. Well, the relationship, you know, I mean, I, I mean, outside of thinking she's going to get mugged. I mean, the very obvious thing is the relationship and it doesn't mean I don't trust her. Andrew is very famous for saying, I trust the, I trust the locks on my Lamborghini, but I don't park it in the hood. I trust my girl, but I ain't going to put her in a club in Vegas. But see, I would have also confidence in her, let's say, eight friends that she's going out with. That they're all going to be looking over each other, assuming that you know the friend group. You're Bro, one of those girls wants dick bad. One of those girls, maybe two out of the eight, are definitely willing to cheat. And that's an energy just like the one we talked about with the hiring process. I'm telling you, girls night wild wine, woo -hoo. Titties out. Everybody's looking good. No, bro. I'm See, not doing it. It's just, oh, this is so okay. far outside. So, of, like, so I'm not what doing I'm what I'm curious yeah. is, here's an argument that I heard that actually sounds really great, um, which was, if you can't be the man where she will always, independent of every other variable, pick you over every other person that exists on this planet, then why is it in your best interest to continue to be with her? If you have two perfect people that are independent in their own regard, they're making good money, they are fully self-sufficient, doing their own thing, and they choose to be with each other even though they're perfect on their own, that is a relationship that is not based off of any needs. It's not based off of, hey, like 
you know, I'll push and pull, give, get. It's just based off of I like you or I, I love you for who you are and nothing more, nothing less. Let's be together. Cool. And I, and I would follow up to that and say in 2023, that is the archetype of what a couple should be. Do you agree? Like, People are trying to be two individuals. That's one of them. Yeah. That come, like, I think it's a very popular one. Mm -hmm. And it don't work. The divorce rates are higher than they've ever been. There's more single people. And if you follow Rolo at all, he said, by, I think it's like by 2040, like half of the women will be childless and not married. Doesn't work. Now, I do want to say the divorce rates, because that was something yeah. I, I've looked into in the past. Right. And I even go so far as to be like, statistically, what has the highest divorce rates? Usually it's marrying young, but it's also what, what raises it to the 50% is the second, third, fourth marriages, which have like an 80% failure rate. From what I've seen, people who have an education, who make a certain amount of money, I think it was more than like $80,000 a year, who marry above the age of 25, I think the divorce rate was more like 25, 30%. It's still high, yeah. but still less than the 50% when you account for all these other variables. Now, the other thing is that maybe they haven't been married long enough to see the divorce, but they are marrying later with a lower divorce rate so far from what we've seen. Either way, I do believe in generals and I don't believe in suppressing a person, but I also believe in not setting them up to be put in a bad position. That's all. Because hey, let's just meet for coffee, can turn into many things very quickly, especially if the man knows what he's doing. But, but see, part of me believes that like, if that happens, I would be so glad in a way because I, like, I if know- If you got cheated a, on? Because I would know without a shadow of a doubt, that's not the person for me. Without, I would have had no doubts in my mind to be able to walk away very clearly. Like that to yep. me seems like I would rather just that happen and move on. Right. I, like, and, to and me, I get that, that would seem like a bit of a relief in a sense. It's like, okay, now I know. There we go. You know? And if, and if she would be happy or so, by all means, like, obviously, I'd be upset. But to me, that would just be a clear signal that, hey, this wasn't meant to be. Yeah, I get it. I got a message from a guy today. He told me, he said, hey, man, um, my ex cheated with her ex-boyfriend. I got a DNA test, but she is pregnant with my child. Bro. Mm -hmm. How do you move forward in that? It goes from, hey, I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet Kevin to I cheated on you. I don't even know if this is your kid. It's just, man, there's certain lines. I also feel like there's got to be red flags. There's, there there's are. Gotta be, there's got to be and signs there, and there are and micro signals. things sure. like Instagram posts or girls trips or uh, there's a, a multitude of different things it could be. You know, guy friends are going to lunch with dudes. Like there's no way. And listen, I'm not trying to be this chauvinistic asshole i just believe that if you're firm in these things women respect it i guess i take the approach if someone's going to cheat they're going to cheat regardless if you say you can't go to the club they're going to find a way around it if that's the objective i think if a girl really seems, i think if a girl really 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 loves you she don't want to go anyway i agree but she i don't want to go anyway but i think there's also self-esteem issues i think there could be issues in the relationship itself where she doesn't feel like she's connected. Now, I'm not saying this is right. justification, but I could see issues in a relationship that would prompt somebody to want to go and cheat. And that type of person who would go and cheat, instead of resolving those issues, I don't think is a person that I'd ever want to be involved with. So it just seems like to me that's a filter. Unfortunately, you have to go through the hard way right. of figuring out, hey, this is not what I want to be involved in. This person is not for me. I would also add to what you just said by saying women generally don't want space until they already have a foot out the door. And so that would be something to consider as well. Just knowing what it looks like, you know? So that's my thoughts on it. It's been really good to me, man. You'd be shocked. You can sit down with a girl and when she sits down, she's damn near liberal or, or bad bitch all the way. And by the time I leave the date, she's very traditional. I've watched girls fall into the feminine frame right in front of me many, many times. A lot of women message me even now and they say, look, I've watched you on podcasts and you've really helped me get in my feminine frame. You've made me a better wife. I get a bunch of messages from women like that or asking me for advice because they're madly in love with their husband and he's maybe screwing up. 
and like, what can I do to wake them up? I really love them and believe in them. I think those are the best women ever, as long as they're not indirectly trying to hit on me. How are they screwing up? Like in what sense? I'm just curious. I got one today, man. It's a guy has an addiction problem, you know, and she, she really loves him and she really believes in him. And he told her that if they were to have a child, he thinks it would turn around. And I told her that that's not true, that having a child is not going to change his ways. And I went into fitness and I wrote her a couple paragraphs and then I sent her a voice memo about why I thought it was important that he gets sober, get in shape so he can have a clear mind. He probably does want to do better for you. He probably does want to have a family with you. But unless he gets sobered up a bit and gets into some kind of good physical condition, he'll never have the energy to do so, you know. And so um, I get messages like that quite a bit. And a lot of women just thank me for almost giving them permission to be what they already are, Mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, I think each relationship has its own rules and structures. I can tell you mine do. And they're not, they're traditional and non-traditional in a lot of ways, but there's no mistakes about who the leader is and where the frame is. See, I tend to also think that people show themselves very early and that you could learn a lot about a person really from the first like few dates, whether or not they're present with you, if they're on their phone, just just like with your employees, if they go and gossip about other people, but, but those are all red flags that I think, unfortunately, just people don't pay attention to, they don't care. Maybe the other person's hot and they're just like, you know, I'll put up with more, but you know, all of this stuff because yeah, you know what? They're good looking, but you know what else I'd argue? Sure. You take the same woman. You give her to man a, and she'll act one way. You give her to man B and she'll act a completely other way. Women don't text on dates when I'm with them, but I bet they text on other dates if they're not interested. And that's why becoming the best type of man you can is so important. So if you take religion out of this, let's just take religion out of it for a second. Who is she going to respect more? Some guy that's working valet at the hotel I'm at or Graham Stephan. Let's say y'all are equally attractive. Sure. She's like, man, this dude's got his shit together. He's got this, this, this. I don't think shit together has anything to do with that. Oh, bro. No. Status, status, money. You're not fat. So, so. But like all these different levels of being a guy, a thousand percent. I've had completely different experiences in my early 20s going on dates I, I was driving a lotus i had houses i was, I was you know working a, a good real estate job they would much rather the dude who's having a fun time with his buddies carefree you know sleeps on his, his friend's what age, couch what age is that but what age early 20s I right say. so they call Maybe that the, they call that the yeah. hoe phase right sure so rollo has a book called the rational male i believe he covers it there so he's like from 18 to 27 is what he calls the hoe phase from 28 to like 35, I guess is the epiphany phase. It's the, Oh shit. I better have babies soon. I got to start taking this serious. So you were dating girls in that phase. Mm -hmm. Girls were leaving you to have sex with athletes and chads and jocks and bad boys and all those other things. Um, but all things considered, Mm -hmm. let's say a 33 year old woman, goes on a date with you and goes on a guy that looks just like you and you're Graham Stefan and he's not, Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now, she's putting that phone away because it's about the man you become. Yeah. The world treats you differently. So what if you're, what if you're on a date with a woman in that phase? How, which phase? (laughs) Explain it. Which, which which phase you talking about like an 18 year old? (laughs) The like 20 year old, 22. I'm 24. Cool. So the women I'm dating are within that age range. (laughs) I got, I got a hack for you. (laughs) You just provide it. Here's the hack. Okay. Date women, twenty eight to forty. I would prefer. Bro, those bitches to. got snacks, bro. But I would prefer. They're not. the best. They've been divorced already. Have crazy sex. They don't expect anything out of you. When I was in college, bro, but okay. How do I, I had find? some older girlfriends when I was playing football in college? They were like thirty. But see, I, I thought think I was a big boss. Jack wants to date. You know what? I should be speaking for you. Yes. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so if okay. I if I'm trying to find my person, right, my lifelong right. partner. And I'm dating women that are in that age range. How do you discern whether or not they're a subscriber of that ideology, right? <laughs> of that phase, or there's someone that's actually looking for their lifetime partner, or you find someone in that phase, but you try to get them out of that phase. Like, how do you maybe yeah. bring someone out of the, the hoe phase? If I were 24, I would not even be looking for a long time partner until I was at least 28. And I feel like 28 is pretty young because- Look at it for what it is. You most women marry a man between six and seven years older than them already off the rip. So that means you have to go down to like 18 
right? The problem is she has to get from 18 to like 28. She's going to have certain feelings and want to do certain things in her life and trying to force her not to, or, or like it's, it's, it is set up for failure. And that goes right in line with what you said about people mm -hmm. getting married past 25. If I were you genuinely, I would do nothing but get jacked, get your money up. You're already fucking handsome. Stop, man. Bro, <laughs> fuck you. You're pussy. You can't even fight. I'll can slap fight. the Let's shit out right of you right now. now. Let's go right now, I'll boy. slap the fuck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but Just take this outside. Okay, no problem. <laughs> All down the but, the but the point I'm making is, is girls your age want men my age. Most often. We, we've built everything in our life. I mean, women get their value right off the top for free, right out the gate. They need to try their best to not be promiscuous. So higher value men later would take them seriously. And people ain't going to like that, but I don't care. Men don't want women. Look at what's happening with, what is it, Logan Paul right now? Everybody's mm -hmm. making fun of him because his girlfriend fucked everybody. Yeah, Bro. but I don't believe I don't. I, I don't mean, either. I don't like, either. Yeah. I don't either, but I, I'm just giving you an example yeah. of the perception of that, right? I actually have no idea and don't care. Yeah. But if I were you, I would put my head down and get so deeply ingrained in fitness, I'd go box, business, everything that y'all are doing and build your money and build yourself as a man. Because I'm telling you what's going to happen. And it's probably already happening to you because you're good looking and shit and you're doing things. Women are just going to jump in front of you. So I truly believe women bet on horses. They look down at the field and they're like, which one of these guys are going to win? And some girls, and oftentimes good girls, especially because you're work, 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 they're just going to jump in front of you and you're just going to run them over. And you might end up having a girl. I had a girlfriend for like five or six years in my 20s. She was a bit crazy. And I, and I told her that I was going to have other girlfriends and she acted like I didn't say it. So I did. And she'd get mad and just back and forth. But, uh, you know, I was around her a lot. And um, if I were you, man, I, I truly mean this. I wouldn't even be looking for a wife right now. There's so much you have to do. Yeah. And those guys that get married early, they never achieve what they should have achieved. And it doesn't work because he never becomes a man he could have. Well, I'll so. say from my own experience, I didn't truly come into myself until I was probably 28. Yeah. Really? I was Brother, told so much. I was told when I was yeah. 18, I started working in real estate and I was told people are not really going to take you seriously until you're 25. And like 25 is when it starts to happen because it starts to level out in terms yeah. of your maturity. It's like a mental thing it, about that I age think, too. Yeah, I think it was just relating to other people in such a way that you you couldn't do before the age of 25 because you haven't had the experience. But even me at 25, like I was insecure. I would overthink everything. I wasn't sure of myself. You didn't have enough experience with women. No, I didn't. And, you, and you're going to need a lot of experience with women. You're going to need to see how they act. You know, you're going to need to go through relationships, sleep with someone. I mean, I'm not saying you're not doing that, but, you know, like experience the different parts of the relationships with the girls. I just wouldn't want to see you get your heart in. And I'll tell you another thing, a guy like you particularly, I'm not trying to be your mentor right now, but I'm just well, using you ahead. for an example. Go ahead. A guy like you that's ambitious, that's going to do a lot of good stuff. You might settle for a girl based off the man you are today when you're going way up here and then that's going to create a whole nother problem for you because the girl you can really get at your maturity let's say between 33 and 35 is probably going to be substantially better material probably more beautiful probably a lot of things better than what you can get today and i just believe that to be true and do so you believe though that there's value and having someone come up with you and building that shared thing, not necessarily together. So my, but my I think that's a, a thing, I think that's a bit away. more of a pipe dream. My parents met in high on. school. My dad was a senior. My mom, I think, was like a junior. Or in the seventies or the eighties, bro. Eighties. Yeah. All right. Jack's like hey, I, I don't really have any rebuttal to that. That's can that's, I have this water? Yeah, go for it. Thanks, bro. I don't drink water. It's just coffee. He, he's insane. <laughs> it's horrible. Insane. It's really bad. By one, he, he doesn't drink water. I, I, I kid you not. He drinks yeah. no water. I That's do wild. in a protein shake. Okay. Just a protein shake, optimum nutrition. I don't water. know how he survives. That's wild, bro. It's coffee's water. Here's the thing about your parents, man. In the 80s, your dad might see one woman every now and then in a Walmart parking lot. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. He can live in the same town with her for the next 20 years and might not see her again. Right. But now it's That's over. Media, yeah. It's over. It's over, bro. And 
on a daily basis, you're going to be getting compared to other men. So a couple of comments uh, about this whole conversation. So being in the dating pool, I've noticed certain girls look for certain things. Not every girl is in that phase. Some girls are not. Some girls clearly are based off of the evidence or in my own personal experiences and stuff like that. Um, I would say everybody's a little bit different, different strokes for different folks. There is this phase. Yes, that does exist. I have seen it. Uh, but also there are definitely other people that are candidates that are good, open-minded people. And I do think that there is some merit in growing up with this person because you don't necessarily want somebody to like you just based off of external factors, such as how much money you have, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's such a small component in terms of money because there's always going to be someone else with more money. Always. Yeah, like money right. was the but one I think, thing I think like, oh, more internal values, such as are you an honest person, right? Yeah. Are you punctual? Uh, can you rely on this person? Stuff like that are better and stronger foundations to build relations, successful relationships sure. off of rather than other things that sure could be indicators of those traits, but such as wealth, such as, I don't know, maybe like fancy shoes and stuff like that, you know? On a scale of one to a hundred, what percentage based off of where you believe you're going to land as a man, do you feel like you're already developed? I mean, that's funny because when I... When I was like 19, I thought I was at like 70. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about this a couple of weeks ago. Just like ago. a dickhead 19-year-old. Yep, what do you I think was, now? Uh, I hope low. Uh, I hope I'm at 30, uh, maybe 20. But realistically, I would say I'm at maybe 40. And there's a bunch of things that you don't know that you don't know yet. Myself included. I think it's best for a man to try to develop and really get a grip on his life, who he is, what he wants. Because well, all I want for anybody that either watches my content or that's my kid or for somebody I love or a friend is for them to have choice, you know, and there's a lot of developing to do before you can even get to a place where you actually know what you want in the first place and what that looks like for you. You're going to change a lot in the next five years. I agree. Astronomically. And what might look good to you today might look horrible in five years. And so if you were married it could, it, it doesn't really set you up for success. And I think that's why the, the failure rate is so high. Now, if you were 35 and she was 25, then maybe, you know, you're in the ballpark, but I wouldn't do it until I was in my thirties for sure. Well, I think some of it is coming into who you are, knowing who you are. Yeah. A thousand percent. Itself, I think makes you attractive to more people so yep. that you have more options to pick from. But it, and then but, it's not coming from a place of scarcity. It's yeah. really like, you know, I want to be with you, not because you're the only option, but because we get along together. But people can also fall for that. At 19, when he thought he was 100% there and his chest was poked out, he can talk like a very confident man who knows what he wants. He sounds decisive. He didn't know it all, and neither did I. And I can tell you right now, I'm still developing as a person. I don't even know what percentage I am. I, I hope it's less than 70 for damn sure. I hope it's 60. I hope I have a lot of growth left in me. Um, but you at 24, man, you're going to do so many things and you're going to grow so much. I, from 24 to 30 for me, huge deal. From 30 to 35, it's probably 10x that. Let me ask you objectively. I'm 33. Okay. What growth did you see between 30 and 35? Stress. Stress tolerance. The businesses were growing. I got down a million bucks one time. I should have went bankrupt. Um, I started to see what was important to me. I made big money for the first time and bought things and did things and really got to experience like full cycle. Like my Lamborghini is cool. I wouldn't trade it for my Ford and it doesn't make my life. It doesn't make me happy. Growing makes me feel happy. So I have to learn these things about myself. Where are my weaknesses? How can I fill in those weaknesses? You know, everybody has weaknesses. The more you understand yourself, the better you can build the castle around you, right? Because I don't want to hire another person like me. I'm me. I need people to cover my blind spots. Where am I not competent? What do I don't know that I don't know? You know, what mentors can I build and learn from? How do I want to align with the values of other people? Mm -hmm. And do I feel confident in my values? It takes a lot of confidence for me to come on the internet and say some of the things I say, knowing the amount of hate I'm going to get for it. But I know who I am and I'm okay with that because my real life is so good. There's nothing anybody could ever say to me on the internet that would make me even look twice. They can call me whatever they want. My life is incredible. I am genuinely happy. 
And it took a lot of pain to get there and it took a lot of understanding of myself. And it took a lot of even forgiving myself on things that I might not be as skilled at or disciplined at. And so I set up structures to make up for those things because ultimately I want to win. I want to have choice. I want to be an honest person. I definitely want to be myself because if I can't be myself, I can't even respect myself when I'm being something fake to somebody else just so they'll like me. I'm one thing away from them not liking me anyway, so fuck them. Have you ever lost a job because someone sees you online, they see the company that you work with and say, ah, I don't want to do it, anything to do with this guy? Yeah, I've had that happen with, you know, Andrew. I have, but I don't give a shit. Fuck them. Because for every person that hates me, I feel like I get 100x people that love me for who I actually am. Yeah, yeah. someone loving you for who you actually are is a lot more That's powerful than 100. one person That's hating worth, you. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, more than 10 people man. who like love you for maybe who they believe you are, but it's not actually who you right. are. And those people don't even actually know me. Case in point, the whole phone call we had about me coming on here and the risk it is to you. I respect that. I really do. I don't have a problem with it at all. I'm just glad I got the opportunity for you to get to know who I am. I'm sure there'll be a negative comment on the video if you post it. And if you don't, then... I've still enjoyed the hell about uh, spending time with you guys and I've been wanting to meet you for a while. So it's good to me, but there's no way I can walk out of here and not know that I gave you myself. And as long as I give myself to you, whether you like it or not, I was true to myself. And I believe that if there's what, 8 billion people on the planet, bro, if I can have 2 billion people, love me for who I actually am. Other 6 billion can hate my fucking guts because it's very rare that you have that many people or any amount of people actually love you for you. You actually are. And I sleep with no skeletons in my closet. And that's a very free feeling for me. And I'm able to tell people the truth all the way. There's a lot of people that live a life where they can't even be their full self because they're too scared about what other people are going to think of them. I can tell you not having that feeling is like having a load taken off of you like nothing else. And a lot of people believe that there's nobody out there that will love them for who they are for whatever reason. And it's just not true. The good thing about 2023 is that you can go find a group of people that believe in, in what you believe that you're kind of like your souls align with. And once you have just a small group of people, that love you in that way for exactly who you are. Everything else would just be noise. And I am very lucky in that way. And I have genuine happiness because of it, because I don't have to lie to anybody. And I'm very grateful for that. I feel very lucky and very blessed to have that in my life. And I had to get to that. And it took me about 34 years to do it. What pushed you over the edge of getting to that? What happened at 34 where pushed you over the edge a little bit? I really struggled with guilt all throughout my teens and twenties. I felt like I had to come out of the closet and tell everybody that I was not gay, but I really liked women and I didn't particularly ever believe in, you know, a man like me being monogamous. I just didn't. And I was so scared that people were going to hate me so much for it. And people do hate me for it. My issue with that is that if I were to tell you that I'm gay, I would be automatically protected. But if I tell you, hey, coming out the closet, I'm super straight. I like women. I'm going to tell them all the truth, but I'm going to have a bunch of girlfriends and a wife and a family and all this other stuff. People will fucking hate you for it. But so many men have a wife and a family and they're watching Pornhub every night. Or they're slipping around with their secretary. If I'm nothing, I'm honest. And I give people the opportunity to leave if they want to. Choice. The only thing I want for myself, for my kids, for my friends, for my family, and particularly the people I love. And so if they choose to stay with me after I've told them the truth, or they choose to be with me when I tell them the truth, I'm not a bad guy. Now, it might piss people off. But again, if I were homosexual, I would be celebrated. I'd be a hero. But if I tell the truth about my sexual preference, I don't have sexual discipline. It's crazy. What do you say to people that say that, that you could be more disciplined and just like you are about, in the about gym, sexual things? Yes. Yeah, about cool. Not being awesome. promiscuous or being yeah, a I get it. person. I get it. If there's a pizza sitting on this table right now and you were on a diet and I wasn't 
and my preference was to eat pizza, but I still have a six pack. Is it discipline or do I know how to intermittent fast? Do I know how to have what I want in life? It's a preference. I'm not insecure. I don't need attention from, I like it. So you're saying because it's not hurting anybody, it's not hurting your wife, it's not hurting your girlfriends, they're all fine with it, right? There's no sacrifice that you're actually making aside from these other people's perceptions that you may not even care about in the first place. My that wife, well, first right. of all, my wife helps. She's a fan. We bring girls around, <laughs> you know? Oh and, oh, and by the way, before everybody starts hating on me, go get a man by himself and be like, yo, bro, if your wife said that you could bring a smoking hot 22 year old blonde over and y'all could both do it would you do it if he tells you no he's a fucking liar you know what's a really, liar okay i don't know man i mean i will say that i i don't i couldn't do it i'm i'm like one person i just i don't know I, it, Look, it's man. Just, but i think that's how but a bunch I'm of people wired. are wired different like, but a bunch like of people are wired different man wired. it doesn't need to be every guy it what? could be a, a lot of guys bro in the 90 percentile 90 let's say he says no Bro, what percentage of men watch porn? It's a high percentage. You think it's all those guys? Oh, no, I think it's almost every man. <laughs> almost every man. Are you telling me if you had a girlfriend, she was like, hey, I want to bring Shelly over. We both want to have sex with you. You would be like, no. I don't know. It's never happened. Well, you need to have a threesome and you need to get in a fight. Let me, <laughs> you know, it's actually really funny. Uh, so I was talking to this girl. Can I just say something? I'm so sorry. I don't you mean may. to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't make you a man. Sleeping with a bunch of women doesn't make you a man. What makes you a man? What makes you a man is that you know who you are. You stand by what you believe. You don't put on a mask or tell people what they want to hear so they like you. And you do what you say you're going to do. And you're loyal to the people and the commitments that you've made. You can be ethical and find the people that will accept you for who you are. Aren't there also good qualities that you'd like in a woman too? Everything well, that's you not listed, what we were talking. We we're just talking. About I know, it. but what makes a man? I'm just saying. I think it makes. I think it makes a solid. I think it makes a solid person. I'll tell you another anybody. thing. I don't yeah. do, and I think it's super lame when I see people do it. They'll start their comment on YouTube with "A real man would." Who the fuck are you to take somebody's man card from them? These people have no photos on their on their account. They're probably fat as fuck. I could be like a real man's in shape. A real man is a millionaire. I would never, ever, ever attach or say to somebody they're not a real man. I think that's a dumbass thing to say, you know, and I don't need the ego boost of like taking their manhood from them. It's like if I were to tell you you're not a man because you didn't have a threesome, it'd be the fucking most asinine thing I could ever say to you or that you didn't get in a fight. So you're not a man. That doesn't mean you're not a man. I don't define what makes you a man. You do. And so. I think that's, I think that's a really great point. I think for a man and a woman, but it's really just a solid person, you know, like we're not always like, I can very clearly see that we don't agree on this subject. Right. But I've absolutely enjoyed and loved this conversation and really Me like too. you both, you know what I'm saying? So like, why do we, why would we not be friends just because I like to have a couple of chicks to the house? Like, pfft the hell out of here i'll also never stab you in the back in a deal i'll tell you another thing i'll never do i'll never look at your wife crooked or do anything other than say graham is a fucking man when mm -hmm. you go take a piss because that's what a real friend does for me a, a, a sure. good friend a loyal friend you know i'd rather punch myself in the fucking face and hit on your wife you know what i mean because if we're friends and i have no honor then what am i good for you know i can be disciplined as hell on on this subject you know, if I need to be case in point, a friend guys lose friends all the time. They've had for 30 years because they don't have any options in their life. And they get close to that, that girl that, that was married to his best friend. And then he ends up sleeping with her, bro. You don't have many friends in this world. My favorite line from any movie in history is in tombstone. There's a, there's a shootout guy asked doc holiday. He's like, Holy shit, man. Why'd you help him? He said, cause he's my friend. And he goes, man, I got a lot of friends. And Doc said, I don't. That's my favorite line in any movie ever. Because Doc Holliday understood that in life, you're going to have a handful of friends. And anybody that believes they have more than just a handful probably doesn't have any at all. And that loyalty is something that like, I really pride myself on having. And I've gotten a good opportunity to take up from my friends recently. And I feel very lucky to be able to do it. Being a good person 
like you said, I think it's almost a bi-gender thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's being true to yourself. What are some of the questions you think <clears throat> the viewer should ask themselves that could be productive to observe? So I think, for example, people should always question their relationship with finances, question their relationship with money, ask themselves questions about how they feel about spending money on this versus spending money on this versus saving and stuff like that. That's a good one. Ask themselves questions about their relationships, such as their friendships. Why do they value their friends? What do they value in their friends? Are those good values, period? People that they're dating, parents, et cetera. What are questions you think the viewers should be asking themselves if well, they want to be productive? All, I think all of those things that you just said are incredible. I think that some of the questions should be based off of where you are in your life. Like every person has a life cycle. Every business has a life cycle. Every career has a life cycle. I would ask myself, not for competition's sake, but maybe how am I doing in comparison to my peers? What can I do to get ahead? What am I doing on a daily basis to set myself up to be successful later? Am I in the right career path? What is the guy 20 years ahead of me that does exactly what I do? What is his life like? Do I want that life? I think that's one of the biggest ones you can ask yourself. I, agree with that. I, remember, I was one of the youngest members of the Metal Building Contractors Directors Association. And I'm sitting there and everybody's like 25 years older than me. And I'm looking around at these guys and I ask myself, I said, do I want this guy's life? Some of them, maybe. A lot of them have like heart attacks and shit. Construction is very stressful. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to buy real estate very quickly. And the second I started making money, I just started buying it. And um, the reason I did that is because I looked at their lives and I said, man, no disrespect. They're very help helpful. And, they're, and a lot of them are millionaires. But I don't know that I want this life, not for another 25 or 30 years. So what do I want? For me, it was freedom. And so I started looking out there for people that were living a life that I thought I might want to live. And I think it's very important that when you're looking at these people, don't make the assumption that you're special. Don't make the assumption that you're going to work harder than them. Don't make the assumption that you're smarter than them because more than likely you're going to run into the same punches that they did and evaluate their situation. Do they make the kind of money you want to make? Are they in the right business vehicle to make that kind of money? Do they have the freedom that you believe you're going to want? You know, do they have the stress? You know, do they have the relationships that they want or is work stressing them out so much that they bring it home. There's so many things you can learn about where you're going from the people that are already doing exactly what you believe you want to do. And if you just don't think you're special and you look very closely at all those layers of it, you could reset your trajectory long before you're too late. Cause it's just like you guys know, if you tilt a plane, just five, 10% and, in New York City, by the time it was supposed to land in San Diego, it lands in San Francisco. My main question for myself, outside of like my personal integrity, myself and everything we've talked about and being who you actually want to be, would be looking at the people that are 20 years ahead of me and asking myself if I want their life. And for me, I didn't. And so I had to make small adjustments. How did you start buying real estate? What was the main focus on that? Was it purely just you want cash flow? You want to retire? You want something yeah. to fall back on? What was the motivation? You know, it was really, really important to me with real estate is that I didn't want to be that guy that made a bunch of money once. I was actually scared of that. I don't really care that much about the cash flow at all. I really care about the appreciation because I'm probably going to do the whole buy, borrow, die thing anyway. Mm -hmm. Trust it. Um, and so for me, I want to be rich for sure. I want to be wealthy. Wealthy is, you know, the difference between being rich and being wealthy is one of them is destructible. One of them is not. Actually, Brandon Carter asked me lately, do you have a money goal? And I said, no. And the reason I said no is I really have a layers goal. I want layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer of income. That way I know that no matter what happens in any climate, any condition, anything that comes up for me. I'm impenetrable. So I'm curious what that is, like what your definition of wealth yeah. is and what that income layer is for you. Well, as far as income goes, um, I mean, to be quite honest, I don't need to make hundreds of millions of dollars. I probably will 
on, at the rate that I'm going and I plan to develop more and do more things because I genuinely like the game and the chase and the climb of business. But I think the happiness thing, I think they've done studies on this. It's like somewhere at like $2 million a year. You're not much happier until you get to like maybe like something stupid like 10. And then that that amount of happiness is super small. That was Ty Lopez. I learned more about that from Ty Lopez than I have from anyone else. He said that you don't want to be the dude making like 20, 30 million dollars a year because that person's taking all the hits. They're taking all the criticism. They're taking all the liability. It's the people making one to three that have the best work life balance. They're making enough to pretty much buy whatever they want. But they're flying under the radar in yeah. terms of, you know, being a punching bag. Right. Taken on. He said that most people were, were the happiest in terms of that upper bracket, one to three. Yeah. So what is it for you? Last year I made about five. Um, and you know, you know what's very humbling about that to me? I met guys like Ed Marlette. Dude has an island. You know what I mean? Like in I somebody told me the other day they, it was a negative comment. They're like, they said something along the lines of like, you're not any effing Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. And I think that it's important for the young people to really understand this is that there is such a huge gap between me and that person. That person, let's say they make 75K a year and I make my 5 million or whatever I make or 3 million or four or seven or whatever it is below 10. I might never, never, never be Steve Jobs. 100 million, 200 million, billionaire, Amazon, right? But I can tell you that the gap in happiness between me and Zuck is probably pretty small with less pressure. But the gap between me and the person that said that comment is light years. So what is your ideal net worth or monthly income that you'd like to strive for? Like I said, I, it's a layers thing for me, you know, um, I'd love to keep making what I'm making right now. Sometimes I pitch myself and I'm like, man, there's no way I can keep doing this forever. You know, you know, because the bit, one of the, one of my main businesses in this prime, the steel company and everything we're doing online, it keeps growing and growing and growing the real estate portfolio. Can you share how that's broken down? If you have as Jack says, a pie chart, Yeah. you have your income. How is that broken down between the businesses? I'll make around four in construction and I'll make one to one five on the internet. And then I'm pushing everything back into the properties because I don't like the debt atmosphere right now. Mm -hmm. So I want to drive as much equity as we can into the properties to reduce the impact of debt service at, you know, 6% rates or an 8% rate. And then some people are holding IO for us. There's a balloon coming up and I want to be very, very equity strong when that mm-hmm. refinance comes. Sure. Now, why would you make less in the construction business? Because it seems to me that- No, I make more. Been... I make the most in construction. Yeah, but, but, but I'm just saying like over time, over the next 10 years, because you're, you're afraid well, of be, just making uh, well, it I'll tell, you, I'll tell you. That to me seems very stable. Uh, such a long well, standing career. I'll tell you why. Is I don't think construction is brick and mortar. It's not near as explosive as the internet. And it's also very eat what you kill. I don't think I'll ever start another business where I don't get a lifetime return on investment of energy or at least a very long one, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you hold a property for 20 years and maybe you exit or you hold and borrow against equity. Insurance company would be a great example. Like I've, I've talked to Ed about possibly starting an insurance company myself, you know, because once you get a client, you're gonna have them for quite a while. Construction is very much bid, hope you make money one time, then hunt, 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 hunt. I don't think I'll start another business that is one hunt, one kill, and then back to hunting ever, ever again. Seems like you do really well training people how to do construction or some sort of learning, some sort of online, you know, education company on Kind of like gym yeah. launch, but for construction. Yeah. Cause I don't as far yeah. as I'm aware, that doesn't really exist. Like a network of contractors people that want to get into the trades like if i want to be an electrician i'm sure it exists i'm just not aware of it i would love a community of other like-minded electricians that we could work together grow together you know if if i get a referral i just don't have the time i could bid it out to to someone else i could refer that if it's in a different area there's a network of just bringing people in those people so valuable those people exist those groups exist they're just in person okay and they're ran by like 60 year old white men (laughs) i mean so you why know, you, it seems like to me that's your perfect well, business. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Is because 
there's a lot, there's a lot of growing pains in construction. And then also right now, as for now, Andrew and I made a deal that we would work together on what we're working on. And so I'm not going to go back on that deal. You know, he's been really good to me. We're team. And that's how I look at it. So it was a very easy decision for me not to do it. I get asked to do it all the time. And I do think I'd make a shit ton of money. But there's other ways to make other businesses. And one thing that I really like about the social media thing is that I'm acquiring very, very good talent. And what I love about having a brand is it creates a whole different relationship from the start of working with somebody. Previously, in my old life, if somebody came to work for me, it was very much kind of a, I don't want to say mercenary, completely different from the people that want to come work for me now because they know who I am. They know what I'm about. They, they all, it's like they already have the core values. They already want to jump in and bang and row the boat and take it places. They already actually like the guy they're working for, which is a very uncommon situation in this world. And so if I can keep acquiring talent off the internet, if I can continue to buy properties, if I can continue to work with people I care about and there's a purpose and a mission behind it, you know, you know, what's so crazy to me is that I get stopped like 20, 30 times a day for photos now, which is very new to me. But what I've noticed about it is instead of saying, Hey, like, like an athlete or an, or an actor, Hey, I saw you on the show or Hey, you know, I see that you pay, play for the Dodgers. They're stopping to tell me you changed my life. What you say matters. And I enjoy being a part of that movement. And me and Andrew have done a lot of that together. It's very fulfilling to me. And so for now, until either things change or they never will, who knows, or we do something else, uh, I quite enjoy it. And the money ain't bad, but more importantly, I'm really helping people. And unlike real estate and construction, when you hit a schedule or you give somebody a roof to, to put over their head, the people that I'm helping now actually genuinely appreciate it. In construction, no news is good news. In real estate, yeah, that's true. in real estate, not having a big rent roll of people that haven't paid you or is good news. So no news is good news in those businesses. And so when it comes to online or teaching people how to be a contractor, um, I just don't feel like it's time and it might it never be time. Sure. It's funny. Anytime the property manager calls me, you're like, fuck. Stinks. Cause I know something's broken like yeah. automatically and yeah. they could automatically fix things. I think it's up until like 500 bucks. Yep. So I know automatically system. it's more than $500. Yeah. If they call me. It's terrible. It's an awful feeling. Bro. Okay. <laughs> like, so what, we just bought this mobile yeah. home park, man. And I guess the old owner would let people pay like on the 25th of the month and they're just constantly a month late. I see a rent roll this morning of like, it was like 16 grand that we have not collected. Now we're still cash flowing. Yeah. But we should have been cash flowing 22 grand. Where, where was the property? It's in Louisiana. It's in Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, you know, people have to get used to the new management, the new systems. You know, I've noticed it seems happen. like older landlords, they don't care as much, especially if the they property, don't because they're the always there. Paid, they're cutting the grass. The property's paid off. Oh, yeah. The guy There's less money. of a concern. They value the peace of mind than collecting a little extra. Yeah. You know? Or making them do it on time. Sure. He doesn't. He doesn't yeah, want they're it. They're just he, like, all right, funny, late, funny you all say right, this. Me, yeah. he, he owns an electrical company. Really cool, dude. I really yeah. like him a lot. Cool. Um, really, really smart, man. He really turned that park around. It's really nice. He so really. It was a really, in my opinion, like a very fair exchange. Sure. He like tripled his money, over tripled his money, but it's still a strong cap rate. It's still good after debt what's, service. What's the cap rate? Bro, it was like. It's got to be bro, for it's, a mobile. It, bro, 11, it was like 12. 12. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the debt service on it is like 16. But if, if we get it 95% and everybody pays rent on time, we cash flow 20, 22 grand a month. You know, it's worth it. Now the balloon would come up. You know, because he's doing I.O. for us. So we have to go into traditional financing. But um, I'm actually super hoping in the next couple of years kind of goes the other way 
I don't think it could go very much higher. Now, I think it could kind of get stagnant. You, you want inter- you mean interest rates to go down? I'd love to see them go down. Yeah, I think you know? every, everybody would. Yeah, and but we'll but, see what happens. And, I don't know. But even if it doesn't, yeah, even if it doesn't, these properties, I think people make a big mistake by looking at cap rate. I don't. I don't. I mean, cap rate's great, cool. You know how the p- property performs, but I think a big mistake that you could make is not understanding debt service. And like understanding where the debt's coming and when it's going to balloon, even in the cycle, even in the long, like if like you ever watched the Ray Dalio video, long-term, short-term debt cycle, yeah, kind of like understanding where you are in that long-term, short-term debt style, debt cycle in regards to whether it's a five year or 15 or a seven year, whatever the balloon is. Mm-hmm. Like even now I'm going to constantly be shopping debt. You know, it's just something I want to do. And then insurances and just, just everything about it. So, um, yeah, it's a, the only thing that's nerve wracking for me is debt service, really. Because cap rate's cap rate. It's very non emotional, you know? Yeah. And we're always going to be raising the rents. Isn't that risky, though, that in the event interest rates end up going up five years from now? Isn't that always the risk? Not if you lock in. If you lock in now, then your biggest risk is not maintaining a property or having the area deteriorate yeah. in value. Yeah. Then that's are, the what, biggest are, risk. Are you getting. How, how long has it been since you bought a commercial property? Never bought commercial. Only and, so this is commercial. Yeah. So I can't get this fixed rate 30 year, you know, yeah, but you can still fix seven, 10 years. But yeah. That's what I just said though. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, where are we in seven years? You know, where are we in three years? Cause some of my balloons come up in three. Now the good news about the ones that come up in three is we have extension options on them to extend where they make more money. We try to offer like a couple different offers. Well, I think, you know? I think the difference here is that you're doing, it seems like interest only balloon payments. Yeah, they are. Which, so it's lower money up front, more cash flow up front. Way but more cash flow. at the risk flow. of five years from now, what happens when that resets? Well, versus it, doing, it, you know. Yeah, I get that. But it, or, you know, something for 10 years and it the interest rate could, could bump up a percentage based on. Yes, sir. But it's certainly better than taking an 8% interest rate from the bank right now. Because I believe if I had to bet, Mm -hmm. now I'm not super bullish on this, but I think after the election, and I don't think it's going to be a lot, just a little bit, like a point or two, but that point or two is huge. People don't understand how one point is to a property. One percentage point. And to lock that in, like to, it's all. I think there's there's been analysis. I think one percentage point equates on average, it's between eight to 12% of a property's value. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. So a million dollars, 1%, all of a sudden it's a hundred grand off. One thing that I'm making for certain that I'm doing is that I have no refinance penalties. And um, that makes me feel good because I do believe the rate. And and I'm also telling the banks, like, listen, you're giving me this loan. You're not giving me a penalty. I want to refinance with you. Just give me the going rate, what's out there right now. So we'll see. But I'm very excited about it. They cash flow. Um, there's definitely work to be done. There was some cap, like I bought 64 apartments in December and there's definitely CapEx. The mobile home parks that we have in Ohio are, are doing well. And I feel good about that. And it's really just about getting all the systems all the way in Yeah, and, uh, getting the plane off the ground, man. Here's an interesting question. Cause you grew up in a, in a trailer park, right? Yeah. I lived in four on it. So I lived in them on and off. Yeah. What is that like for you owning a trailer park, having grown up in one? There's a song, a country music song called I'm going to be somebody someday. Uh, one of the first things I did was get in my truck and drive through that park, listening to that song. You ever heard it? No. Oh yeah. You should. You should. It was, it was good for my soul, man. It was everything I'd ever dreamed of. Like I always dreamed of, you know, making enough money where I could buy real estate. I own the neighborhood, bro. I own all of it. There's 60 trailers in there. And I see all those mailboxes. I own this place. It's not even about the money. Yeah. You know, I'm not even pocketing the money. It, it's about the achievement, you know, to me. And the fact that I know that I'm taking care of my future in such a solid way, with such a solid asset, you can touch it. I have plenty of crypto. Mm-hmm. But I'm not, I'm not as proud of my crypto as I am my real estate. Yeah. Because it was always my goal. You know, before YouTube got big, real estate was re- like bigger pockets. Mm-hmm. You yep. watched your stuff. Uh, it was the only 
it was the only thing I knew. And, and people forget this. When we talk about subscription based models. Real estate is the OG of the subscription based model. It's like the OG. Yeah. And I don't even meet many people in the self-development space or people that want to get better that don't say they want to own real estate. I actually did it. It means every, it means so much to me and it's completely non-monetary. Yeah. You ever see kids in the trailer park and think, you know, that was me at one point and want to help them out? I have that moment. Yeah. I have that moment. Um, I don't really think like I, I'm open to helping them. Mm-hmm. I have the, I remember that, you know? And also have the thought, like, they can get out of here, you know? And it's up to them to realize that or not. If they were to come up to me and ask me, um, which one thing that I haven't experienced yet is that one of my tenants know me, you know, with a lot of people that know me now. um, I'm sure it's going to happen. And I can't wait to unload onto that um, because it's probably going to be a young man, right? I can't wait to sit them down and tell them. I'll sit right there on that porch with them and tell them they can do it because I believe it. I've seen it and I lived it and, um, and I know it's true. It doesn't matter where you come from or what it is like you, if you can flip it into a strength somehow that, that it makes you stronger then you can achieve anything you want. How do you think that made you stronger? Like what was life like growing up in a trailer park? How was it different from an apartment or a house? I lived in bad apartments too. Like remember when I told you I, I lived in a neighborhood where I was kind of like the only white kid. Mm-hmm. That's why I never, I'll never let a person tell me that race is the reason why they can't make it because I know too many people of too many different nationalities and I believe that real love is dark and if you really love somebody you'll shake them and tell them the truth even at the expense of them getting upset with you I'll never let them say that because they're short or tall or Muslim or Christian or atheist or black or white or Spanish that they can't achieve what they want to achieve in life because I believe that the only people that believe in race are all these other things are the ones that are either not willing to do the work or want to get affirmation that they wouldn't have made it anyway. But I don't believe that. And I want there's two like I have a clip that went really viral about me telling a, a black girl that suppression is bullshit and believing in race is for broke people. And I got a lot of support from the black community because of it. And my point was, is there's too many young black men that follow me that look to me for advice. There's no fucking way I'm going to let you sit here and say that not in front of me. These young men can do it. And I know they can because I know a bunch of winners like bro, Brandon Carter. If Brandon Carter's not a winner, I'm fucking I'm not a winner. Mm. You know, like if that dude's not a winner, Myron and Walt, look what they've done in their lives. I've got teammates from college that have done amazing things. They're black guys. There's no fucking way I'm going to let some 15 year old kid believe he can't succeed in life because he's black. I grew up in his neighborhood too for a little while. And I grew up in trailer park. So fucking what? You know, it really goes back to like, what are you, are you going to take control of your life? I always say the best day of a man's life is the day he realizes that nobody's coming to save him. If he can know that and feel peace about it and almost be excited about it because he gets to go fight his own hero's journey. Mm-hmm. He'll win. If he can accept it, he'll win. Because you take entire responsibility for your life. Too many people give up responsibility in their life so they can point the finger at somebody else. If you take all of it, even when it's not your fault, I've had to do this so many times, particularly around hiring. You take responsibility for everything, regardless of whose fault it is, or the market, or a race, or religion, or who's president. I don't give a fuck who's president. I'm going to win no matter what your blind grandmother could be president. I'm going to win. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do the same thing I did yesterday because I know what I'm going to do. I agree with that. And I would just, I just refuse to let a young man believe that based off his skin color. It's bullshit. And if I really love him, I could say the politically correct thing. Like, yeah, I know, you know, you're so suppressed. It's so sad. Bullshit, bro. You can win. And I'm not going to sit here. You can get mad at me if you want, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. Because that is the truth. And I know too many winners of all ethnicities, all races, religions, for me to say anything else. And it goes right back to that thing about being true to yourself. I'm not going to sit there and let him believe a lie. Not if I can help it. Because a lot of people have relationships where a guy's fucking up in their life and they're supposed to be friends. That guy walks out of the house at, at, let's say, a group setting and they talk about how that guy's fucking up. That's not love. Love 
is taking that motherfucker in the back room and be like, hey, bro, you're fucking up and I don't care if you're mad at me. You need to fix this shit now. And you'll stand in the fire of him being angry with you and you don't give a shit because you actually love him. That's what love looks like to me. And that's why I always say real love is dark. You know, I'll tell you another thing. Mm. If we're in a, let's say me, I, I just said this to Ryan today. Let's say me and you are in a real estate deal and I disagree with you on a subject. I'm not going to disagree with you in front of him. I'll wait until we get, it's just me and you and I'll ruthlessly take up for you because back to the loyalty thing, back to the doc holiday thing. I got a bunch of friends. I don't, I don't have a bunch of friends. I got a handful of friends that put on the line for each other, man. So I think that's good etiquette. It was Dave. Was it Dave Ramsey? We were talking about you met uh, Dave Ramsey. Yeah, we did. How was we're that? Actually, going back are in you? less than a month. Did y'all yeah, argue? A little no, bit. We, we, no, no, we had, really. we had a conversation. No. Dude, he was we had a amazing. clip that, that was he cool? Pretty, yeah, he's dude, amazing. He's no, awesome. Bro. Dave is the nicest guy. Like I was starstruck bro, to see him. I, I got this super so cool. You know, it's really yeah. funny because of like the way that like I'm looked at online sometimes. There's people that I assume will hate me. Dave Ramsey's on that list. And then I have a list of people that I really hope I meet them before yeah. they get an opinion of me. Theo Vaughn's number one. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, bro, I'm both from I fucking yeah, love Theo so Vaughn. And I'm like, I saw him and I saw him when he was here in Vegas. Yeah, I'm like, hilarious. Please let me meet Theo yeah. Vaughn so we can talk about white trash shit and bologna sandwiches on trailer park porches and alligators and, and shit like that before he sees some dumb clip of somebody saying I'm a dickhead. So that's all. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a list. Like, do you have, do you have like a, like a list of people you want to meet that you've not met yet? Oh yeah. We have a whole, Steve-O was on that list. Really want to, what? Meet, really want to meet Steve. Uh, bro, I bet he's yeah, cool no. as fuck, bro. Uh, Rob Deerdick. So, uh, Tony Hawk. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson would be on there. Yeah. I actually uh, said some stuff few, about yeah. Jordan recently. On Tom Billy. Yeah. Yep. You know, you know, I, I won't say I regret it, but I wish I would have framed it differently because I super like him. And I think he's done a lot for society. I think it, um, it, it did come off as though you do like him. So yeah. that was just me as a casual viewer. Yeah. It didn't seem like you like him. It was just the fact that you disagreed with some way that you could have understood what he did as hypocrisy. Yeah. And, and I did feel that way a bit. Um, and also, I just that morning watched a video because I brought it up. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what I don't like about it. Because I, I think he's a great man. And I brought it up. And that's kind of what I don't like about it. But I was watching a video. I think he I watched a video about something he was saying about Tate that morning. It was just on my mind. And I thought to myself, I'm like, this guy definitely knows him, you know, but you know, it is what it is. If, if I saw Jordan Peterson, I'd tell him how fucking great he is. I mean, he, he's a very impactful man. And, and I, I think he's helped a lot of people and I really respect him a lot. I think Tom yeah. Bill, you articulated very well, the level of stress and struggle that Jordan Peterson had gone through before he resulted to going on antidepressants and stuff like that, yeah. which is like, I mean, impossible to conceptualize. Yeah. But then, but then also in all fairness, who the fuck am I to say that he can't get on it? Life is hard, bro. If antidepressants helped him, I'm not here to judge him. I'm not fucking Jesus. You know what I mean? Like that's I like, think, I yeah. think that's a great model to live by. And it's something I've learned where yeah. like beforehand when I was 19 and I thought I knew who I was and who I would yeah. be, I would think, no, I know what's best and for I other think people. That's what and I don't I, like about it. And I have the ability yeah. to judge other people because right. I think I know more than yeah. they do. But then in the past couple of years, I've had like dose after dose after dose of like, oh, this is kind of what life is like. And yeah. it's, it's honestly hard, bro. opened my brain and removed the capability of judging people not well, entirely of course because everyone judges people it's just human nature right but like yeah. for the most part yes well, i think it's speaking negatively you're speaking on someone else and that was yeah. my point with dave ramsey yeah. i think and you would have been in the room and if it wasn't him i apologize we were talking about managing style and he said one of his biggest regrets early in his career was that he uh, spoke negatively to an employee that they were doing a bad job in front of other people. And he Cannot should do have that. done that in private. Cannot and it wasn't that. in front of like a large room. It doesn't matter. I think it was just in front of other people. And this was early in his career. And he apologized to that employee later on and corrected the behavior. But I think it's speaking on other people on public matters yeah. that are maybe yeah. for them a little bit more private. Exactly. And, and that's, that's what I actually don't like about it, regardless of my opinion, because I, I respect the man. I actually like Michaela. You know what I'm saying? I would like, love to have her on the podcast. Oh, she asked me to come on. She uh, asked you to oh, come you should, on? You yeah, she did. No, nah, I think yeah. it's a sneak attack. I think she saw what I said. 
So I told her I want to talk to her because I wanted to clear this up with her uh-huh. because I actually respect the girl and I like her and I like Jordan. You just be up front. And, and, well, I wanted to get her on the phone, mm-hmm. but she was kind of cold with me. She's kind of like, oh, we'll just email. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. sneak attack. It might be worth it. I would do it. Yeah. yeah. And be, just be, be up front. Maybe so. Too. Maybe it, so, man. I've said things online before be a that I great it, learning experience and just so, something that, hey, 10 years from now, you're going to look back. I'm not like, scared hey, of it. Yeah. Here's what I don't want. I, my goal is to love some people. And in the past couple of years, I've gone on a lot of shows where it turns into like this angry thing, bro. I ain't an angry person. Those podcasts will make you sound angry. And, and I also talk a certain way. You know, I talk kind of aggressively. I curse a lot, you know, and I just want to have good relationship with people. It's particularly people where, you know, I respect your dad. You know, I don't like what he said about my friend, but that doesn't make me a person that should be judging him. And that's what I don't like. And I brought it up. You know what yeah. I mean? But any any man's gonna any man that can self reflect at all should be able to say that publicly. I don't have any issue with that, man. I know who I am. And I like the girl. I think she's cool. You know, I spoke to I've spoken to her previously and um I found her like I found her to be really cool, man. So maybe I will. Maybe I'll just reach out to her and just tell her. Yeah, yeah, man. But And at the very least, you hear a different perspective. And that's something that I've yeah. been really pushing myself on is to hear out other perspectives and pick and choose the things that I resonate myself and then incorporate them into my own life. Yeah. And that's something that I've been definitely exploring. You've been yeah. doing a good I job. Of, let me just yeah. take <laughs> one minute <laughs> right here. No, we don't need a minute. No, no, 10, no, seconds. Ten seconds. Because when I oh, met I was, Graham yeah. and for the first couple of years I knew him, he yeah. was so in his own lane yeah. and very, very, very just like stubborn. Just like yeah. headstrong. He knows who he is. These are his opinions and values and no one can inflict any of their like opinions or values onto him. But recently he's been doing a very good job at being truly yeah. open-minded. <laughs> I'm very happy for him. It's Very actually super for easy for me to do it. Yeah. Um, but on some of those shows, it's not you know, to hear somebody out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, coming on these types of podcasts, and again, I can't emphasize enough. I'm so grateful to the guys that believed in me in the beginning and brought me on their shows, and I will continue to go on their shows. I would just like to represent myself holistically. That's all I'm saying. I do think it's okay to be strong and know what you're about and know what you believe in and not have to shit on people. Let That's me ask all. you this. What would you improve about the red pill space? Where do you think the weaknesses are there that you could help better? There are some really good women in this world. Really good women, trustworthy, loyal, good mothers, you know, um, intelligent, can help you make money. I'm not saying the red pill space doesn't say that, but I, I think by and largely there's a feeling that women are not as smart or they're not as good as men. And I think that men and women are equal because we won't have any humans without women, but in completely different ways in what they bring to the table. And I don't have a problem with that. You know, I really don't. And I think sometimes based on how some of the conversations go, and I'm not just talking, I'm not talking about fresh and fit. I'm talking about like the red pill space that doesn't get projected. I don't feel that gets projected in the correct way. And have you ever heard of red pill rage? No. Red pill rage is this thing that men go through when they get red pilled because they realize and they can see things they've never seen before. It's a very real thing. I felt a little bit of it before. Um, and I think the, the full maturity of that is getting to the other side of that, you know, anger when you find out that maybe girls might act a certain way or maybe certain things that you, but like, like a lot of guys get really, really hurt and damaged because they bring flowers. They do everything she said. They're a simp. They have no frame. They've watched too many rom-coms and they think that's how love works. And it, it doesn't, it, not in the real world. And they get really upset when they, when they lose that girl or they can't even get that girl. And she goes for the asshole guy. And when they start to understand 
some of the things that the Red Pill space teaches, which by the way is super, super important, right up there with understanding money is female nature to me after fitness. Then they get a little angry and bitter and upset about that. But I think the full maturity of it is to let them know that there are really good women out there and that you can have a good relationship and all women aren't hoes and all women aren't trash. And a lot of them you can work with and make money with because they're smart. My issue with it, what I think that they could improve on is similar to what you said, like the way that they say things implies and there's a bit of a subtext of like females or women being like inferior. You know what I mean? Like they're not explicitly saying it, but subconsciously that would be the way th- language or, language or bad. that their women are bad. They're bad. It, like language, I think Tom Billy who said this or maybe it was Hormozy. Language is how you understand the Hermosi words. is second on my list behind Theo of guys I want to meet before yeah. they don't like me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dude, I think he's a shit. Hermosi I think he's cool is amazing. Yeah. But language, language is... And his wife, too. That's a great yeah, example. Layla is amazing. Layla's, Layla's awesome. Bro. Well, yeah, she's incredible. Bro. Bro, she's a beast. Yeah. 100%. But anyways, language is the way that you understand it. It's not how you're actually putting out the words. Thousand and I think a lot of people can understand that language in a way that shows that women are bad. And it's not explicitly what they're saying. It's not what you, it's but not it's the language what you're being, saying is how it's said. It's being the, it's, yeah. it's the language that's What I don't that. like is that it seems very victim mentality from what I've seen and heard from the red pills. Well, that like, hey, you know, I'm a victim of this and that. Let's go and shit on the women. And I don't. Banter and bicker about it. Like that's I slightly dif- disagree with that. Right. I think that they're sharing with you the things that can happen to you. And what women actually want. And I do think that's, I cannot, like, I think the red pill space saves lives. I really do. I think it saves guys from offing themselves. I really believe this. I know that Rolo is saying, and Myron and Walt and some of the other guys that are in the space have really helped guys develop in a way and create better goals and start working out, understanding what to look for in a woman. So they don't, a lot of guys just pick a bad woman because they don't know any better. They go only off of pretty. They don't know the signs to look for. And for that reason, Myron and Walt are saving lives, bro. I'm just keep using them because I'm close to them. But I think they're absolutely necessary. You know, um, that said, it wouldn't feel right to me to not give the other side a red pill rage and what my experience has been. And the only thing they can say to me at that point, oh, it's because you're a Chad. Okay, cool, bro. But I know a bunch of guys that aren't chads that have really good relationships with women. There's a lot of good ones out there. You just need to know where to look and to find them and how to set your frame up with them. And you also have to maximize every part of your life. So you're in a position where she wants to get inside your frame. Because I think that's mostly what it's about. A woman wanting to be inside the frame of a man. One thing that you said that actually was really interesting is that you don't need to have game. You don't need to be able to spit. You don't need to be able to like nope. be smooth with your words and pick up girls and stuff like that. Yeah. But you need to just be that guy. Yeah. That's what because you when you're that guy, you absorb women and they act completely different around you. Which I actually think is like, I it's a don't know how much women true. prefer to be hit on and have games spit on them and stuff like, like, I don't know if that makes them necessarily feel that special, but if they see a dude who's just like walking through like a chat. Not in the way that, you know what I mean? But like, yeah. like being that guy, being that yeah. guy, they're like, oh, you know, I, I'm, but interested. you know what being that guy allows you to do? Just be honest. That's true. See, I think it's just being unapologetically yourself. That if you own whatever you are, correct, you believe in, whoever's finding that attractive would be, would gravitate. But you know what that. most often creates the ability to unapologetically be yourself is to handle all those areas of your life. That's actually what gives you the confidence. Yeah. It's the woman that a young man walks up to because he learned how to nag somebody from a pickup coach and say, ah, oh, you're kind of okay or you're a little fat to make her feel insecure to even out that balance. That's never going to work long term. But if you're that guy, you can either help her get in shape or you can find a girl that you're actually attracted to and walk right up to her and say, excuse me. I couldn't help but notice you're pretty and it would have bothered me very badly. I would have been upset with myself if it didn't come say hello. Hi, my name's Justin. What's wrong with that? Because the truth of the matter is, if you're going to DM a girl and say, hey, I think you're beautiful. Let's go get a drink or whatever that is or Miami or whatever. A hundred guys a day tell her that and they're not that guy. You could say the exact same thing to that girl and she'll respond completely differently. 
And that's why I think the red pill is helping a lot of people because it's putting people on the right purpose to put themselves in a position to be that guy. Yeah. Well, I think on that, then it's also the frame and the posture and eye contact and, you know, so many sub communications, yeah. but even think, online, but you can walk though, up and say anything at mo- that point. Yeah. With, exactly. You know, I, I made the joke on a, yeah. I think I said it on fresh and fit. I said, I yeah. like, bro, I can literally, you know, you could take a guy who has not taken care of his business in life. Right. And he could send a hundred messages that says, Hey, you're beautiful, Miami question mark. Could take a guy that has all of his shit together and he could send another hundred messages to that same group of girls and said, Hey, dickhead. And the guy that had taken care of his stuff, that is that dude, probably get more responses than the other guy. Haha, ha, you're so mean, or I'll fight you, or just whatever. You know, I, I really think absorbing women is way better than chasing them anyway. If you're that guy and you're around and you're kind and you talk to them and treat them like a person, the crazy, the craziest thing, uh, people like act like I'm crazy. The fastest way to sleep with a woman is try, not try to sleep with her. Her whole life, every, especially beautiful women, her whole life, men are either catcalling her because they're below her. They're probably well below her and don't think they can get her anyway. They might as well swing for the fence or men are aggressively trying to sleep with her, her whole life. She's like dodging penis, you know? Mm-hmm. Her whole life, the second she gets boobs, especially beautiful women. So if you can sit there and treat her like she's not this fucking alien because she's so beautiful, like, bro, she's going to be like, drop her hands. She's like, wait a second. He's not trying to drop, boop, stick her ass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? I did not go in the that's direction that I, yeah. <laughs> that I, I yeah, that's but, but. No, because now what you're doing is like girls that are like, oh, this guy's being nice to me. He just wants to get in my pants. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's a dangerous message to share as well. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What was the boom part then? What the, was the, the boom part is. What is this in the boom part? What is this member? Okay, let me. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> but but the point I'm trying to make is so many guys are very clearly and obviously trying to sleep with the girl, trying to sleep with her. If you can just treat her like a normal person, not put her on a pedestal, but not treat her like shit. And talk to her just like I'm talking to you and get to know that person. Women want connection. You know what I mean? And if you're able to, <laughs> what? Cramp. I just think of Josh doing that clip. Right yeah, now. that's way right too funny. Wow. So, yeah, was, it is, sorry, bro. Dude. But it's a really good analogy because yeah. men are aggressively hitting on women all the time. And she's like, boom, 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 boom. You know, mm-hmm. and if you can just be there in her space and she's like, man, this person's really nice to me. And I don't. I don't feel like he's like you know you know what the difference is what? it's going in with the intention of expecting or wanting something yes versus not wanting something you don't and want to women go into a conversation women, needing something from the other person yeah, exactly. women You're not can sense it yeah, and that's why i don't believe in pickup lines because it's almost like you have your dick behind your back and you're gonna get her with it I'm like no bro like hey yeah. You're very, you look really pretty today. I want to tell you, it would have bothered me if i and like I, I literally why I is it always this. your line why, every time you say because it's honest because right. it's completely yeah. fucking honest. Say the line. It, it was. I just said it a minute ago. It's like, hey, I couldn't help but know she would have really bothered me if I wouldn't have came to say hello. And I felt like a coward. See, I would have given t- you my number. Yeah, of course, bro. Because it, it's also vulnerable, but it's also very bold. Especially, it's you know, confusing. I, you, you know, know how it makes you, me want to know more. Well, and then also, you remember how you said, I, "Like I have that presence." Yeah, bro, I'm looking her dead that, in the fucking eyes. But that's the thing: eyes, if you bro. walk up, like, "Excuse me," and no, like, oh, I'm dude, fidgety, <laughs> I do it. Like, no, 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 no. Oh, this is. I, I'm really glad. You, I'm really <laughs> glad you talk for you, man. I like, just. I'm regret. Yeah. so glad you said that because I really do like this. I'm like, excuse me, I I say it with some bass. Like, there's no way she can't hear me. Do you purposely yeah. deepen your voice a little bit? I, I do it loud enough and deep enough where there's no second guessing. Mm-hmm. And then I'll tell you another thing that I do. I can't think of the last time it didn't work. It's been quite a while. Let's say you're in a grocery store. Women will put themselves in your space if they're interested. If they're not interested in you, and it's even a thought that you might hit on her, she'll go to the other end of the grocery store. I've seen so, I'll be, let, let's say I'm at the grocery store, at the gym. And I'm working out. A woman will, I've, I watch women do this all the time. They'll come and they'll start working out like within 10 to 15 feet of me. Women generally are running from men. So if you're in the grocery store or in the library or on campus or something like that, and you're a young guy, and that girl puts herself in your space, she's trying to tell you to do it. Sometimes. A lot of the time. 
a lot of the time has been my experience. It's been very rare. And I'll tell you another thing I do to practice that is like once a day, I try to give a person a compliment where I don't want anything. Hmm. That's a good, that's a, gr- I Jack, like didn't that. you say that you were supposed to talk to five strangers a day? Yeah. Yeah. How'd yeah. that go? Good. Yeah, yeah. One did of it? my, yeah. One of my Not favorite. all of them. No, but I did a couple. <laughs> no, I did. I did a couple. I did a couple. So one of my favorite things to do is to, is to particularly walk up to a woman um, and, and say, hey, excuse me, same way. It's good practice. Excuse me. I don't want anything from you, but I just wanted you to know that I think you look very pretty today. And I love doing it to kind of older ladies, you know? Makes their day a bad. You look really pretty today. Have a good day. And just walk the fuck away. I'll tell you a couple things that does. That's good for practice, but it's so good for your soul, man. It's so good for your soul just to give somebody a fucking compliment. Anytime I'm not feeling like if something bad's going on or whatever, I start complimenting people immediately. And for whatever reason, it like it like charges my soul. That, that would stick with a person for probably a few days. If Bro, it was a random thousand percent. Compliment, you walk away and they're Especially like. Especially from a tall, better. handsome motherfucker like me. <laughs> Show them the bottom two abs. Yeah. <laughs> but yo, why don't you know you're pretty? Bah. <laughs> but, but yeah, man, like um, also have this other technique. I don't know. I feel like I'm, te- I'm teaching no, game. Like the technique. Game and talking about fighting. Just like I'm trying to stay away. But I do have this technique called the backboard technique. Okay. So let's say there's a pretty girl in line at the grocery store. You start a conversation with the old lady in front of you or behind you or in the vicinity. vicinity right. So she can see you're building rapport with like somebody that's obviously a non, it's like a non-sexual thing, right? But that other person gives you validation that you're not a creep. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not being fucking creepy. And so you start that conversation with that person and then you can loop here. And what do you think about this? You know, that's good. And that shit works. I'll tell you another thing that works. I love going to honky tonks when I was, What's a hon- I don't know what a honky it's like a country bar, Okay, you know, swinging, spinning mm-hmm. the girls, dancing, cowboy boots. I have a rule was called, <laughs> first of all, I really like to dance, but. I always say, my friends laugh at me. I say, I don't care if she's 80 or 280. I'm dancing with these bitches. And one of the best things you can ever do is walk up to a group of women when there's a very beautiful girl in the group and grab that fat girl and just spin her ass and laugh and cut up and just have a, or the old lady, boom, spinning around. That girl sees you and you're putting the weird walls down and you're doing it indirectly. So you it's know, a backboard you're, you're not wrong. I was no, a thousand percent I was, right. I was, I, was at a million bar. Times. I was at a bar. This was probably like eight months ago on Catalina Island off of like. Bro, I've Calvary. been there multiple times. It's You've been heaven on earth, bro. Yeah, bro. Dude, I, I've been. my buddy's got a sailboat. I go there all the time. It's not beautiful. really, but I've been there three times. Yeah. Anyways, I went to I've this bar twice. on, it's great. on <laughs> Catalina. Yeah. I think I've actually been twice as well. Yeah. I went to this bar on Catalina Island. I was dancing with this old woman, yep. very old woman, yep. uh, but I was so confident. I went up on the stage and everything. There's a little cage in this bar. I was in the cage yeah. dancing with the old woman. Afterwards, this girl comes up to me and she's like, hey, my friend really thought you were cute. Of course she did. You're dancing and with an old lady. What? It was the girl keto. I thought was cute as well. So yeah, it worked. It's a keto. It worked out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a thousand percent, man. Mm-hmm. It works every time. It's I beautiful. I can't dance. I, I hate bro, you. I can teach you, bro. I I'm fucking bad. Please anyway. teach him. I feel so unhappy. After, no after this podcast, bro, you we're put me try to get a little dance no, lesson for no, Graham. Bro, no, throw no, a B-roll over right. You put, bro, I already already wear tight jeans, bro. You put me in some tight jeans and some cowboy boots and a t-shirt, bro. Oh, fuck okay. shit yeah, up. Yeah, we got to talk about on that. that. On that, yeah. just out of curiosity, okay, yeah. is this just the style that you landed on that you were a real, like, big fan of? Are you talking about my jeans? Yeah. No, bro. I've tried so hard. It's so difficult. I have a 32 waist. 36 long in my quads and hamstrings. So why are, don't you just get wider pants? Yeah, custom made. Bro, I've tried. I've tried Loose almost. I'll tell you what happens. It's like it gets weird in my crotch and I want to be stylish and it doesn't even really bother me. Like I get it all day long, bro. People hate on me so hard for that shit, bro. Fuck them. I got a world class ass. Fuck them. I don't care. You don't think that like, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> bro, you're not going to hurt my feelings. No, I'm not trying that. to hurt your feelings. I'm How just bad saying, like, is this though? How bad is Let this? me see. Uh, it's actually not that bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's, oh, you do have yeah, a huge tight. butt. Yeah, bro. It's, it's tight. Yeah. It's a little tight. I mean, the thing is, oh. it, it fits. It's just, it's just the, the inseam. Do you work little... out your glutes? Dude, I squat. Yeah, a lot. You do? Okay. Yeah. I, dude, I spent, 
I spent most of my youth in a squat rack. Yeah. The thing is, when you stand up and you adjust them, they don't look that tight. But when people catch you in precarious situations, maybe yeah. they're taking a stride or something yeah. like that, then it could really grip around the... Bro, I'll be honest with you. I don't give a shit. Yeah. I really don't care. Then honestly, I think that's what's attractive. Yeah, I really don't care. I think you don't care. And that's... Yeah. I don't, bro. Like, I've tried all kinds of jeans. Mm -hmm. And, bro, in fact, if you were to go to my closet in Louisiana, I bet I have over 50 pairs. Only over trying to find the right fit you know but it is what it is man i'm not mad so they're not skinny jeans these are like normal jeans no just no they're boot skinny. cut jeans i, I, I okay. tell you i thought they were skinny fuck jeans. no bro they're not skinny jeans they're all <laughs> no they're athletic just to give you guys idea, they're athletic that's... cut jeans i'm buying these workout jeans there's the walmart <laughs> jeans that i wear uh that are boot cut yeah bro those aren't skinny jeans i can't even give my cab in skinny jeans <laughs> No, you don't understand. They do. You know how you know how I know. Yeah. They do a ratio. Whatever your waist is, they do some sort of ratio to your thigh. My waist to thigh ratio doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Now, look, I could go get really baggy jeans, but I also look like a fucking goober. Why don't you just wear a belt? I look like a skater. I do. But what happens is when I put the belt on, like, baggy. so I've tried this, right? I've tried to buy 36 waist mm -hmm. so my thighs will fit. But it never tailors out right. And then when I put a belt on, I'm that dude that has pants on that are too big and it all crinkles up and it's all right. It, it, custom. I've done custom. I've not, I've never found a guy that could make it work, you know, and it is what it is. <laughs> they don't man. have enough fabric when they're making the pants. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Large enough. I don't know what it is, man, but you know what? It's never slowed me down. You know, this clip is going to get so many views because it's the equivalent of Ryan Pineda's haircut. Yeah, yeah. Ryan Pineda's haircut is fucking it. dope. Yeah, he yeah. gets a cut like once a week. Once a week, it's, it's insane. Like, bro, he, like, bro, he has a hairline. A I've, a week, I've never so seen a hairline. It's like immaculate. That. It is flawless. Yeah. That is yeah. a handsome motherfucker. Oh bro. yeah, he's gorgeous. Thank bro, Jesus. Anyway, um, now I'm gonna get called gay. Good. <laughs> It's perfect for my People pants. call Graham and I that all the time. Bro, they, they, I get called all kinds of shit. Someone commented, it's like, did you see the way Graham looked at Jack the other episode? Are they dating? Bro, you know what's oh, funny about yeah. that? You know, like, I... <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Going okay. online, you go. really realize how fucking retarded people can be. Or they got nothing to do. Like, they're talking about my jeans on the internet. And what's funny, <laughs> what's funny to me, what's funny to me is there's a guy that said that five comments ago, bro. It's not even authentic at this point to make fun of me for my jeans like get like i don't give a fuck man fuck you like i truly don't care but yeah man i'm still buying jeans i, I try all the time we constantly buying jeans mm -hmm. i'll come I'm home say it is it's the shoes i think if you were to wear sneakers it would balance out the silhouette because you're wearing the the dress loafer and i think when you go from jeans you know my to cowboys loafer, my it, cowboy boots it, are sleek yeah, too it tapers and i, I want it to that taper tape. that's good style it's good style. I bro. think if you wore sne like some bro, Nike sneakers with I've got bar I've got barbell jeans. I've got all these like jeans for people that work out. I've just not found the right pair, man. And honestly, I think it's a good pair of shoes. I think so. you like it a little bit. And I don't think there's I do. I do. <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. And, and, I don't think there's listen, a problem with that. I'm super not sorry about it. Yeah. Like, I wish I could paint them bitches on. Because <laughs> I got an ass and legs that you ain't never seen, right. bro. And and I worked really hard for it. And so why wear jeans? Why not just go with the short like shorts? Like leggings. Short shorts? Just short short. I do wear short shorts quite a bit. I'm not short shorts. No, no, above like, knee. I wear like above the trunks knee. above the knee. Well, yeah. above the knee is kind of in style. It is. Though. Yeah, so like, I, I got a, like a bunch of above the thigh. Nike shorts yeah. that I wear with like button-ups and i'll button them to like right here so my like my whole chest is out and shit it's like a miami vibe look and mm -hmm. i'll wear like the white nikes with the socks like the halfway socks like oh yeah yeah i do that shit yeah i'm sure somebody has something to say about that but that's pretty much my same response mm -hmm. is get some of this because you know i work hard for this ass bro should jack unbutton that top button. I'd go one yeah, more you look button. like a nerd, bro. That's what really? Yeah, yeah I always tell him. I, I would do up here if I could, but then Graham would. If you had, if you had a chest, you wouldn't. I do up chest. Check it out. Got plenty of hair there too. It's like a top. See, I think this looks a lot more relaxed. I do too, man. I like it a lot. Why didn't you say it? If we're boys, wouldn't you tell me? I wasn't really looking for it, mm. honestly. If I'd have noticed it, I'd have said something. All right. Well, now, now I'll just. There we go. I do think that you should shave your neck. I did shave my neck. No, I'm talking about to here. I did. No, like. See all this under here? Oh, this? Yeah, man. So so that beard can come in. No, no, no. Okay, so my brother told me like 
He's when wrong. I first started grinding, you go like this. See this double chin that it makes? Shave all that line. When the fuck are you walking around like this? Well, I'm just saying because if you go no, right. No. Yeah, if you go up too high. Then it looks No, you should weird. go up to here. Like I would leave like a half inch underneath it so it falls under here because you're taking away from your jawline, bro. <laughs> it, like you're, ta- you're literally robbing your own jawline by doing really? it like that. Yeah, fuck yeah. Because your, jaw, your jawline is blending into your neck hair. You need to at least come to the underneath part. I can do that. You should. I'll try it out. It's just my brother told me that as soon as I started growing a beard. So I've just been doing that my entire life. People that come to me, they're like, Jack, you have a beard. How do you trim it? I say, go like this. Go along the line. No, bro. No, you need to go like this and shape up to under your jawline and let it go right under your jawline. Because right. you have this, you have, you have really good beard like outline, right? Thank you. Um, if you were to shape, like, and you also have a jawline, but you take away from it because it blends into your neck. And That's you're really fucking it up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know. I think it's fine the way it is. No, it's, but I like, don't bro, know it's better. It It'll be better like. the other way. I don't know what it would look we like. We should do it after the show. Do you have a razor? We should get a razor. I don't have a razor here. What kind of a what? An unused? What kind of a man? An unused are you gonna, one? I mean, are like you going to tell, tell him a real man has do you a want, razor? Do you, want a, do you want a used one, Jack? Do I want a used do you razor? Want a used no. razor? No, I don't want a used razor. No. I just, yeah, I, I just I should use a razor. I don't use razors. I'll do it. I'll do it when I go home. It's Yeah, yeah. All right. So. I'm very open to keep talking to you, but I have to give you guys some shit. Go for it. So I had to do a little research. Um, and I did. So like Pokemon, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Also. So this set came from Japan. You can only get it in Japan. The guy that got it had to go to Japan to get it. So he was super excited about it. I don't know a fucking thing. In fact, they're having some kind of Pokemon tournament. When I went to the place, if I've ever seen an incel in real life, it, it was probably in that room. At the Pokemon convention? Yeah, bro. And they were I look, like Pokemon. They were I looking at me like, cards, like, like I had a dick growing out of my forehead. Like, what is this asshole doing here? <laughs> What's Turbo Chad doing in here Dude, buying? I, after this, I got to show you. Buying the these collector's cards. But all. these came from Japan, straight from Japan, never opened. And That's so cool. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Dope, huh? Wait, so how did you get these from Japan? It was... The guy got them from Japan. I'm like, what is the most specialty thing you have? And he's like, bro, I got this set of cards. Never That's opened. So cool. I had to go to Japan I, to get uh, it. Is this something that you're supposed to open? Or no. I would man. like to Listen, open bro. it. Don't. No, don't. Don't, don't do ask that. me. Jeez. Don't ask me. Why would you do so, that? Well, thank you, man. Keep I appreciate it that. That's very nice of you. Yeah, that's dope, something huh? you put up, like you, you display yeah, you show, yeah, he. That's kind of how he, he was like yeah. showing off yeah, that he had it. Yeah. You can't get this in America. You got to fly See, to that's, Japan that's to get it. That's a smart thing to do. Yeah, it's cool. Do not open that, Jack. Yeah, it'll probably display be worth some. That. It's worth some money now, but I think it'll be worth money later. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. so that. you, my friend. I really appreciate your content. I've been watching it for years. Thank you. I enjoyed it. You're way cooler than I thought you'd be. Um. But I'm not surprised. Anyway, there's this family. I know you do drums, right? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. There's this family that's supposed to be this special family, and they hand make, um, like I guess what is it called when you hit the sil- like the the metal thing? Symbol. The symbols. Yeah. yeah. So this one is a handmade symbol. Are you serious? Yeah. No, I did. I got to show you the drum. The, the family. Here. Yeah, I don't know fuck about it, but the family made it by hand. Yeah. And their thumbprints is still on it. What? So. Dude, Check this, this is insane. You probably know this family. You've heard of these people? Zildjian, of course. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So this, the Zildjian oh my family gosh. Made this. No way. Yeah, and um, and so here I'll probably just turn yeah. it around. Sure. But let's see if I can get it in here somehow. All right. So, whoa, hundred and. I wouldn't. I can't play with this. No, you can't. No, you can't. It's a display. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah I was like, so I'll, get, is, I'll get some beer. This is number. Yeah. This is number fourteen. Wow. Oh. Yeah. What? Whoa. Yeah. How are you supposed to display this? I don't know. I love. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to touch it. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch it. It comes with sticks, but yeah. I mean, it, this is... Now I got to find a way to frame this. Sick. Dude, thank you so much. You're welcome. Holy Thanks for the cards, shit. man. That's yeah, cool, man. Yeah. That's you also awesome. broke a record on the uh, iced coffee hour. I think it's become apparent. What? The record we broke today. Oh, 
Uh, what time? What was it? Three hours. Oh yeah, three hours forty-five. Oh, yeah. Three hours thirty-five. Three minutes. thirty-five. Yeah, longest By podcast far. we've ever recorded. Second longest, long. yeah. Brett Cooper. Oh, both of you. Yeah, she was the. Bro, sp- was it? Yeah. Bro, you know what? Speaking of Brett Cooper. Yeah, speaking of Mike. Speaking of Brett Cooper. Bro, I s- respect her. I think she's a pretty girl. I'm not like crazy attracted to her or anything, but I super respect her. I hate that she hates me. I don't super care, but I know that if I would have met her in any other circumstance, we'd get along just fine. Oh, dude, we, you should have reached out, had her do a message. I should have. Yeah, we had we had Ben Shapiro on the podcast recently. Bro, yeah. I feel the same way about him. I yeah. love Ben Shapiro. Yeah. I, like, I love Britt Cooper. I think it's funny that she hates me. Like, I'm not upset about I think it. she mentioned your genes, too. Of course she yeah. did. Of course she did. Like, bro, I'm an easy person to make fun of. Like, and, 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 and I'm also a person that people would like to make fun of. You know, but I don't give a fuck. It's all good. I still love her. You know, it's all good. And I love Ben Shapiro. So I don't care. I don't have time to be hating people, man. It's the wrong energy in the wrong direction. I, well, I have, you know what? You could put it out there. There's a chance she'll see this and you never know what might happen. I don't really have any intentions other than, you know, saying that I don't have anything against her. And I, I like and respect her a lot. And I feel the same way about Ben. Cool. Yeah. And Jordan Peterson. So if they want to hate me, they can. But I'm a good person. I know that. And I'm very confident that if I were ever to have the opportunity to meet her and she would give me a chance to talk to me, she'd like me. You know, we might agree on one thing or another. There's no way she wouldn't like me. No fucking way. So, cool. <laughs> cool. With right, that guys. said, thank, thank you, guys you guys so, so much, much for watching. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being yeah, on the Yeah, thank you for coming episode. on. This has been great. Yeah, man, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Sincerely for that. This is, ins- yeah. uh, again, I just got to find a way to frame it. I'm super pumped about it. So, that, thank yeah, you. Let's go check out the drum cool. sets. Sounds good.